कहा है चिति जल पावक गगन समीरा पंच तत्व मिल बना शरीर मैं संस्कृत और दर्शन का विद्यार्थी हूं इसलिए जड़ से बात को समझने का प्रयास कर रहा हूं चिति कहते हैं पृथ्वी को चिति जल पावक अग्नि गगन आकाश समीरा वायु इन पांच तत्वों से मिलकर शरीर की संरचना हुई है इन्हें दर्शन में पांच महाभूत कहते हैं पंच महाभूत अर्थात जीवों का निर्माण इन पांच तत्वों से हुआ है अग्नि जल वायु आकाश और पृथ्वी जब जीवों का निर्माण इनसे हुआ है और जब हम पर्यावरण की बात करते हैं और विज्ञान की बात करते हैं ये जो पांच महाभूत हैं इनके पांच गुण हैं शब्द स्पर्श रूप रस और गंध अब ये जो पांच तत्व हैं जब इनसे भौतिक रचना हुई है जगत का निर्माण कहें या व्यक्ति का निर्माण हुआ है तो पर्यावरण जो शब्द है और पर्यावरण के जो घटक हैं मैं जहां तक समझता हूं आधुनिक पर्यावरण विद या वैज्ञानिक या सामान्य व्यक्ति पर्यावरण की जब परिभाषा करता है पर्यावरण को जब समझाना समझना समझाना चाहता है तो वो फिर इन्हीं चुदी चुदाई ना चोदी ये जो चोद के करे घमंड चुदी चुदाई चोदी ये जो लपक के लेवे लंड <laughs> भाई एक भौतिक पर्यावरण है और एक जैविक पर्यावरण भौतिक पर्यावरण में ये समस्त भौतिक तत्व परिगणित है और जैविक पर्यावरण में जिनसे व्यक्ति बहुत निकटता से घिरा हुआ है वो सारे अवयव उसमें समाहित है जब प्रदूषण की बात हम करते हैं तो जो मैंने पांच महाभूत गिनाए थे अगर उन के बैलेंस को प्रदूषण है जैसे जब आधुनिक वैज्ञानिक पर्यावरण प्रदूषण की बात करता है या करते हैं तो वो कहते हैं जल प्रदूषण वो कहते हैं वायु प्रदूषण वो कहते हैं स्थल प्रदूषण अर्थात एयर पॉल्यूशन वाटर पॉल्यूशन सॉइल पॉल्यूशन नॉइज पॉल्यूशन शायद आप मेरी बात समझ रहे हैं मैंने कहा ना मैं दर्शन का आदमी हूं जो पांच तक तो मैं गिना रहा था मैं नहीं गिना रहा था आचार्य और ऋषि मुनियों की बात है उन पांच तत्वों से जब व्यक्ति छेड़छाड़ करने लगा दुनिया का व्यक्ति दुनिया का समाज तो प्रकृति का जो बैलेंस है वो गड़बड़ आने लगा जब जल तत्व के साथ छेड़ हुई दूसरे शब्दों में इसे जल मंडल भी कह सकते हैं जब जल तत्व के साथ छेड़छाड़ की मानव ने तो वो वाटर पॉल्यूशन कहेगा जब वायु तत्व के साथ मानव ने छेड़छाड़ की तो वो एयर पॉल्यूशन कहलाया और मृदा धरती के साथ पृथ्वी के साथ जब छेड़छाड़ की तो वो सॉइल पॉल्यूशन कहलाया और जब अग्नि के साथ छेड़छाड़ की हेलो तो हीट पॉल्यूशन जो भी अच्छे अच्छे छोड़े सवन को आई लव यू अब बचा एक एक है नॉइज पॉल्यूशन आई लव यू गर्ल्स मैंने पांचवा तक तो आकाश बतलाया था और आकाश का गुण मैंने शब्द बतलाया था मैंने कहा ना पांच तक पांच उनके गुण शब्द स्पर्श रूप रस और गंध जो शब्द गुण है वो आकाश का है और शब्द 
अगर आकाश का गुण नहीं होता तो बत्तीस देशों के डेलीगेट्स और विद्वान मेरी बात को आवाज जा रही है ये सब शब्द का कमाल है और शब्द गुण है आकाश का क्योंकि शब्द जीवित रहता है इसे व्याकरण में हम स्फोटवाद कहते हैं कि मुख के इन ओष्ठों के बाद शब्द निकल जाता है तो आकाश में चला जाता है और वो आकाश में विचरण करता रहता है यही कारण है कि आप मेरे वक्तव्य को मेरे भाषण को मेरी बात को आप सब लोग सुन रहे हैं शब्द गुण कम आकाश तो जो नॉइज पॉल्यूशन है अर्थात ऐसी वाणी बोली है जो मन का आका खोल और को शीतल करे आप हम शीतल को कहते हैं बड़ी मधुर कोकिला है बड़ी अच्छी वाणी मधुर भाषी है और कोई व्यक्ति उसी बात को पूहर तरीके से चिल्लाकर कहता है वो पॉल्यूशन वो नॉइज पॉल्यूशन है अब चाहे वो गाड़ियों की आवाज हो कल कारखानों की ध्वनि हो वो ध्वनि प्रदूषण है वो हमारा आकाश है तो ये पांचों तरह के जो महाभूत है इन पांचों से जब प्रकृति नहीं जिनको हमें बैलेंस में दिया था उपहार स्वरूप हमें दिया गया दिया था उस उपहार के साथ हमने छेड़छाड़ की और पर्यावरण बिगड़ने लगा हाल ही कोविड उन्नीस से पूरा वर्ल्ड त्रस्त हुआ है और अभी भी है तब जाकर लोगों को पता ज्यादा लगा कि पर्यावरण के साथ छेड़छाड़ करना कितना महंगा हो सकता बड़े बड़े धनवान लोग ऑक्सीजन के लिए तरसते थे पैसा था कहा है ना पैसा बहुत कुछ है लेकिन सब कुछ नहीं है तो ऐसे बहुत सारे उदाहरण कोविड 19 महामारी के दौरान वर्ल्ड भर में देखे गए कि सारे साधन संपन्न होने के बावजूद भी लोग ऑक्सीजन के लिए तड़प तड़प कर मर गए ये इस बात को प्रमाणित करता है कि प्रकृति के साथ छेड़छाड़ करना मानव को कितना भारी पड़ रहा है और आगे के भविष्य में हमारी पीढ़ियों की क्या हालत होगी ये किसी एक व्यक्ति की जिम्मेवारी नहीं ये समस्त संसार के मानव की जिम्मेवारी है कि वो इस पर काम करे इसमें सहयोग दे और इन पर्यावरण के घटकों को कम से कम इनके साथ छेड़छाड़ करे बैलेंस बनाए देखिए मैं ये नहीं कहता मैं किसी धर्म की आस्था पर चोट नहीं कर रहा लेकिन आप मंदिर में मस्जिद में गिरजा घर में गुरुद्वारे में कहीं भी जाकर धूप जब बत्ती जलाते हो चढ़ावा चढ़ाते हो आपकी आस्था है मैं भी आस्तिक हूं मैं भी करता हूं लेकिन क्या इससे पर्यावरण सुरक्षित हो रहा है इसके लिए चाहिए हमें कि हम घंटे आधे घंटे पेड़ पौधे जो भी पर्यावरण की चीजें हैं उनमें सुधार करें उनको स्वच्छ रखें थोड़ा योगदान उनमें दें तो मैं समझता हूं कि आप पर्यावरण के प्रति पर्यावरण को सुरक्षित रखने का जो आंदोलन है उसमें आप सहयोग कर रहे हो ऐसा हर मानव को करना बहुत जरूरी है आज जो ये कॉन्फ्रेंस का हम उद्घाटन कर रहे हैं प्रारंभ कर रहे हैं इसके बारे में बड़ी खुशी की बात है कि हमारे पास
लगभग सत्ताईस सौ रजिस्ट्रेशन इस कॉन्फ्रेंस के लिए हुए हैं और बत्तीस देश इस कॉन्फ्रेंस से जुड़े हुए हैं और बत्तीस ही सेशन हम इसमें आयोजित करें वियतनाम चाइना यूएसए कनाडा इजिप्ट फिलीपाइंस मोरक्को अल्बानिया नाइजीरिया ब्राजील बांग्लादेश पाकिस्तान सऊदी अरबिया यमन सीरिया लो लियोन बिशोन इंडोनेशिया इथोपिया कैमरून साउथ अफ्रीका मलेशिया तंजानिया नेपाल श्रीलंका स्पेन अल्जीरिया यूएई भूटान और इंडिया इस प्रकार बत्तीस देश इस कॉन्फ्रेंस में भागीदारी निभा रहे हैं ये हमें गौरव की बात है और इन सभी देश के प्रतिनिधियों को जो भी इससे प्रत्यक्ष और अप्रत्यक्ष से जुड़े हुए हैं मैं उनके प्रति अपना आभार और धन्यवाद ज्ञापित करता हूँ ये जो हमारा सात दिन चलने वाला प्रोग्राम है इसमें बड़े बड़े विद्वान की नोट स्पीकर के रूप में इस कॉन्फ्रेंस को संबोधित करेंगे जैसे आज नोट एड्रेस में प्रथम है प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर अनिल कुमार छंगानी जी जो एच ओ डी एनवायरमेंटल साइंस एंड डायरेक्टर गांधीन स्टडीज सेंटर एम जी एस यूनिवर्सिटी बीकानेर राजस्थान से हैं दूसरे हमारे आज के की नोट स्पीकर हैं डॉक्टर सी उपेंद्र राव प्रोफेसर ऑफ संस्कृत एंड पाली जे एन यू नई दिल्ली तीसरे हमारे की नोट स्पीकर हैं डॉक्टर एस जे एस फ्लोरा एक्स डायरेक्टर नेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ फार्मास्यूटिकल एजुकेशन एंड रिसर्च रायबरेली उत्तर प्रदेश लखनऊ और हमारे पांचवें की नोट स्पीकर हैं डॉक्टर प्रेम अधीश लेखी मेंबर डी ओ सी टू यू एस कोविड उन्नीस टास्क फोर्स मलेशिया आप सभी का मैं इस मंच से हमारे इस कार्यक्रम में मन से तहे दिल से आपका हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूँ और आपके प्रति आभार व्यक्त करता हूँ कि आपने अपने व्यस्तम समय में से समय निकाल कर हमारे इस कॉन्फ्रेंस में हमारे इस आमंत्रण को स्वीकार कर हमारे ग्रह किया है इसी प्रकार कल तेईस तारीख को की नोट स्पीकर हमारे प्रथम हैं नितिन सावंत असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर हैं डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जूलॉजी गोवा यूनिवर्सिटी गोवा और दूसरे की नोट स्पीकर हैं डॉक्टर राज नारायण वारे डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ वूमन हेल्थ एंड साइंस फैकल्टी ऑफ नर्सिंग मैकिवन यूनिवर्सिटी एडमोन्टम अल्बर्टा कनाडा प्रोफेसर नरन वारे जी सब बहुत बहुत आपके प्रति आभार और अगले हमारे डॉक्टर एस विजय कुमार पोस्ट डॉक्टर रिसर्च साइंटिस्ट मैरिन कॉलेज सेंडोंग यूनिवर्सिटी चाइना आपका भी बहुत बहुत साधुवाद अगले की नोट स्पीकर हैं डॉक्टर याहिया बख्तियार फिश बायोलॉजी एंड लाइमोनोलॉजी रिसर्च लेबोरेटरी हजरत वल श्रीनगर जम्मू एंड कश्मीर इंडिया स्वागत है आपका सलाम डॉक्टर याहिया बख्तियार जी अगले की नोट स्पीकर हैं डॉक्टर एम एम सक्सेना वाइस चांसलर कांतिया यूनिवर्सिटी श्रीगंगानगर आपका भी बहुत बहुत साधुवाद अगले चौबीस मार्च को हमारे की नोट स्पीकर हैं माननीय है, डॉक्टर के के शर्मा फॉर्मर वाइस चांसलर एम डी एस यूनिवर्सिटी अजमेर उनके बाद हैं डॉक्टर अगम माथुर एम डी सरस्वती टेक्निकल सर्विस एंड रिटायर्ड चीफ इंजीनियर जयपुर और अगले हैं डॉक्टर रा रश्मि त्यागी इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी यानी आई आई टी रोड की बहुत बहुत स्वागत मैडम त्यागी जी और अगले हैं डॉक्टर राजेंद्र पुरोहित एच ओ डी जूलॉजी गवर्नमेंट डूंगर कॉलेज बीकानेर आप सभी का हृदय से आभार दिनांक 25 को की नोट स्पीकर हैं हमारे डॉक्टर मीरा श्रीवास्तव फॉर्मर प्रिंसिपल गवर्नमेंट कॉलेज डूंग परमसर और फॉर्मर एच ओ डी जूलॉजी डूंगर कॉलेज बीकानेर अगले की नोट स्पीकर हैं डॉक्टर जसविंदर एस संधू कनाडा से बहुत बहुत स्वागत संधु साहब और मेरा प्रणाम डॉक्टर रीतु श्रीवास्तव डिप्टी डायरेक्टर टीचिंग एंड लर्निंग असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर इकोनॉमिक्स एसपी जैन स्कूल ऑफ ग्लोबल मैनेजमेंट मुंबई इंडिया और अगले की स्पीकर डॉक्टर शशि वर्मा एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर पॉलिटिकल साइंस 
गवर्नमेंट महारानी सुदर्शन कॉलेज बीकानेर साधुवाद मैडम शशि और स्पेशल लेक्चर डॉक्टर दिनेश शर्मा जी का होगा मोटिवेशनल धन्यवाद शर्मा जी दिनांक 26 को हमारे कीनोट स्पीकर डॉक्टर मौना कमन है जो वाइस चेयरपर्सन ऑफ फ्यूचर लीडर इंटरनेशनल ग्रुप इजिप्ट एंड कुवैत से हैं बहुत बहुत स्वागत है मैडम कमन जी का अगले स्पीकर हैं डॉक्टर कलीम अरसान असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर बायोटेक्नोलॉजी तमिलनाडु अगले हैं डॉक्टर अभिषेक मेहता असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर आई टी एंड कंप्यूटर साइंस पारुल यूनिवर्सिटी बड़ोदरा गुजरात और इनके बाद है डॉक्टर मोहम्मद आसिफ साहा कैब्री देहर यूनिवर्सिटी इथोपिया सलाम वालेकम प्रोफेसर मोहम्मद आसिफ साहा की नोट अगले एड्रेस हैं हमारे डॉक्टर अजय प्रकाश गुप्ता पर्सन इंचार्ज ड्रग टेस्टिंग लेबोरेटरी जम्मू इंडिया आप सभी का स्वागत है दिनांक 27 को हमारे तीनों स्पीकर साहिबान इस प्रकार हैं डॉक्टर प्रगनेश जी परमार एडिशनल प्रोफेसर एंड एच ओडी फॉरेंसिक मेडिसिन एंड टॉक्सिकोलॉजी एम्स बीबी नगर हैदराबाद इंडिया अगले तीनों के स्पीकर डॉक्टर अनिल मेहता जल पुरुष प्रिंसिपल विद्या भवन पॉलिटेक्निक कॉलेज उदयपुर राजस्थान अगले स्पीकर डॉक्टर प्रीति गुप्ता एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर जूलॉजी एल बी एस गवर्नमेंट कॉलेज कोटपूतली और अगले तीनों के स्पीकर हैं हमारे डॉक्टर सत्येंद्र नाथ हेड डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एनवायरमेंटल साइंस एंड एन कॉलेज ऑफ फॉरेस्ट्री सोपास प्रयागराज उत्तर प्रदेश आप सभी का स्वागत और अंतिम दिन यानी 28 मार्च को हमारे तीनोट एड्रेस स्पीकर्स हैं डॉक्टर सत्य प्रकाश मेहता एनवायरमेंटल कम डेवलप मेंटल प्रोफेशनल ग्लोबल डायरेक्टर आप इंडिया से हैं और अगले स्पीकर हैं डॉक्टर रुचि शर्मा प्रोफेसर एंड डायरेक्टर जागरण यूनिवर्सिटी भोपाल और अगले तीनों के स्पीकर डॉक्टर विकास सक्सेना असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर जूलॉजी गवर्नमेंट कॉलेज अजमेर राजस्थान इंडिया और लास्ट स्पीकर हैं हमारे डॉक्टर मनीष गोयल प्रोफेसर आईआईटी आई इंदौर इंडिया और इसके साथ कि ये वैलिडिटरी सेशन के साथ संपन्न होगा बड़ी खुशी की बात है कि इसमें बड़े बड़े विद्वान और दो आई हमारे इस कॉन्फ्रेंस को संबोधित करेंगे ये हमारे लिए गर्व की बात है उन्हें आप सभी सुधी जनों का तीनों स्पीकर्स का मैं इस मंच से इस महाविद्यालय परिवार की ओर से हार्दिक अभिनंदन करता हूँ हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूँ इस संदर्भ में कुछ बातें मैं और आपसे करना चाहूँगा मैंने कहा था ना मैं संस्कृत का विद्यार्थी हूँ और संस्कृत एक ऐसा महासमुद्र है महाभारत का आपने नाम सुना होगा वेद व्यास ने कहा यदि हास्ती कदन यथ यदि ना हास्ती ना तत् बचे अर्थात दुनिया में जितने विषय हैं वो सब अकेले महाभारत में और जो महाभारत में नहीं है वो दुनिया में कहीं नहीं है सब मेरा सब्जेक्ट संस्कृत का एक महाकाव्य ऐसा हो सकता है और मैं पूरे वांगमय की बात करूं तो मैं दावे के साथ कह सकता हूं कि दुनिया का कोई विषय दुनिया की कोई प्रॉब्लम ऐसी नहीं जिसका समाधान संस्कृत वांगमय में नहीं हो ये मैं दावे के साथ इस मंच से कह रहा हूं और एक उदाहरण आपके सामने पेश कर रहा हो हमारे साहित्य का हमारी पुरातन संस्कृति का भारतीयता का और भारतीय मनीषा का ऐसे ही विश्व गुरु देश को नहीं कहा जाता भारत विश्व गुरु कहलाया वो ज्ञान के बल पर कहला अब देखिए एक उदाहरण मैं आपके सामने देता हूं हमारी जो ये पर्यावरण है ना इसको पारिस्थितिकी शब्द से भी संबोधित किया जाता है तो ये जो आधुनिक पारिस्थिति की है इसके अभिकल्पना का श्रेय जो है जर्मनी के जीव विज्ञानी अर्नेस्ट हैकेल को जाता है 
वहां से ये शुरुआत हुई अब संस्कृत मांग में कहता है कि दस कुओं के बराबर एक बावड़ी कृपया तो ध्यान से सुने भारतीय छात्र हूँ भारतीय विद्यार्थी हूँ भारतीयता की बात कर रहा हूँ भारतीय ताकि मनीषा की बात कर रहा हूँ हमारा शास्त्र कहता है कि दस कुओं के बराबर एक बावड़ी दस बावड़ियों के बराबर एक ताला और दस तालाबों के बराबर एक पुत्र और दस पुत्रों के बराबर एक वृक्ष ये भारतीय प्रज्ञा कहती है ये भारतीय संस्कृति कहती है ये हमारा पुराण साहित्य कहता है यानी एक वृक्ष लगाना कितना महत्वपूर्ण है यदि हमारे मनीषियों को ये ज्ञान ना होता तो ये बात क्यों लिखी जाती क्यों कही जाती और एक उदाहरण दे रहा हूं आपको अस्वत्थम एकम पिंचुमंदम एकम न्यद्रोत एकम दस चिंचणी कान तपिथ बिलवा आमल त्रयंश पंच आम्रम उत्वा नरकान पश्चे हिंदी में अर्थ करूंगा इसका अस्वत्थ कहते पीपल को पीपल सौ प्रतिशत कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड को सोखता है आज का विज्ञान कहता है और हमारा साहित्य कहता है अस्वत पिचुम नीम अस्सी प्रतिशत कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड सोखता है नग्रोत वट वृक्ष जो मेरे महाविद्यालय के अंदर भी है जिसके पीछे मेरे प्रोफेसर साहेबान बैठा करते हैं जो वट वृक्ष है ये भी अस्सी प्रतिशत कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड को सोखता है चिंचिणी इमली को कहते हैं इमली ये भी अस्सी प्रतिशत कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड को सोखता है तपिथ तमिथ ये भी अस्सी प्रतिशत और बिल्ब बेल बेल पत्र जिसे कहते हैं पिचासी प्रतिशत कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड को सोखता है आमलक आंवला चौहत्तर प्रतिशत सोखता है और आम्र आम सत्तर प्रतिशत सोखता है तो इन वृक्षों का रोपण करना चाहिए इनको लगाना चाहिए ये भारतीय मनीषा कहती है ये भारतीय साहित्य कहता है हमारा वांगमय कहता है हमारे पूर्वज पर्यावरण के प्रति कितने सचेत थे कितने सजग थे जो हजारों वर्ष पहले ऐसा लिख गए दुर्भाग्य है इस देश का और इस दुनिया का कि हमारे वांगमय को हमारे पूर्वजों की धरोहर को उन्होंने जो कुछ लिखा उसको हम समझ नहीं पाए या उसका पालन नहीं कर पाए और उसका परिणाम है कि आज पूरा संसार कोविड की चपेट में आया हुआ है और पता नहीं कितने वायरस और वायरस के भी कौन कौन से क्या आ रहे हैं ये सब आ, दुनिया के सामने आ रहे हैं तो ये मैंने मैं कहना चाहता था आप लोगों के सामने और एक बात और कहूंगा कि ये जो कॉन्फ्रेंस है ये प्रथम है अभी नौ बाकी है लगातार ये श्रृंखला हमारी जारी रहेगी लेकिन इससे पहले दिसंबर 2021 में हमने इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑन द मल्टी डिस्प्लिनरी एस्पेक्ट ऑफ एनवायरमेंट एंड सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट आफ्टर द कोविड उन्नीस पैंडेमिक पर किया था ये 15 से 18 दिसंबर 2021 को फोर डेज चार दिन के लिए हुआ था खुशी की बात है कि इसमें भी पंद्रह रजिस्ट्रेशन हमें प्राप्त हुए थे और एक सौ सत्यासी ने विद्वानों ने प्रेजेंटेशन दिया था और फीडबैक के रूप में 4000 लोगों का फीडबैक हमें प्राप्त हुआ था आ, हम इन सब के प्रति आभार व्यक्त करते हैं और इसमें तेईस कंट्रीज हमसे जुड़े थे इस कॉन्फ्रेंस में नाइजीरिया नामीबिया इथोपिया पाकिस्तान यूएसए फिलीपाइन चाइना बांग्लादेश इजिप्ट यूनाइटेड किंगडम कनाडा श्रीलंका स्विट्जरलैंड साउथ कोरिया भूटान नेपाल तंजानिया स्वीडन यूएई मलेशिया डेनमार्क ओमान और इंडिया इस तरह के तेईस देश हमसे जुड़े थे और मैं ये कहना चाहूंगा कि जो दिसंबर में जिसकी मैं बात कर रहा हूँ हमारी इस कॉन्फ्रेंस में जिन लोगों ने हमारा मनोबल बढ़ाया 
नायडू का परिणाम है कि आज हम आई एस टी टी की फर्स्ट करने जा रहे हैं मैं उन सब के प्रति आभार व्यक्त करता हूँ कि उन्होंने हमें जागृत किया और हमें चेताया और हमें प्रेरित किया कि आप और आगे बढ़े और हम बढ़ रहे हैं उन्हें आप सभी का साधुवाद और खुशी की बात ये जो हमने सेमिनार की थी इसकी आठ पुस्तकें क्योंकि तो जिन्होंने अटेंड की थी वो डेलीगेट्स वो प्रोफेसर वो प्रतिभागी ये सोच रहे होंगे कि हमारे पेपर्स का क्या हुआ हमने जो प्रेजेंटेशन किए थे हमने जो पेपर भेजे थे अलवर में अलवर में राजऋषि कॉलेज में राजऋषि कॉलेज में प्रोफेसर ममता शर्मा के पास उनका क्या हुआ तो आपके लिए खुशखबरी देना चाह रहा हूँ कि ये जो आपने पेपर भेजे थे उनके लिए हमने आठ बुक्स हम उसकी प्रकाशित कर रहे हैं और ये आठ बुक्स अंडर पब्लिकेशन है इंटरनेशनली जॉइंटली फ्रॉम इंडिया एंड कनाडा जो कि इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस था पहली बुक का नाम है एनवायरमेंटल पॉल्यूशन ए थ्रीट टू ह्यूमन लाइफ बुक नंबर दो एनवायरमेंट द ग्लोबल सेनेरियो बुक नंबर थ्री इमर्जिंग ट्रेंड्स इन सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट बुक नंबर फोर कोविड उन्नीस पेंडेमिक ए डिजास्टर बुक नंबर फाइव मल्टी डिस्पेनरी अप्रोच टूवर्ड्स फार्माकोलॉजी बुक नंबर सिक्स रिसेंट एडवांस इन साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी बुक नंबर सेवन रिसेंट एडवांस इन साइंस एंड इकोनॉमिक्स और बुक नंबर एट रिसेंट एडवांस इन साइंस एंड लर्निंग टेक्निक्स ये आठ पुस्तकें शीघ्र ही संसार जगत के सामने विद्यत समाज के सामने आपके हाथों में होंगी ऐसा हमें आप आशीर्वाद दें कि शीघ्रता से आए और हम उन्हें लॉन्च करें जगत के सामने और ये ट्रेनिंग आज से हम शुरू कर रहे हैं तीसरी का भी मैं थोड़ा सा बीस से छब्बीस अप्रैल को हमारा आई एस टी टी की टू होगा बीस अप्रैल से छब्बीस अप्रैल जिसका टॉपिक है इम्पैक्ट एंड पेनेशिया ऑफ एनवायरमेंटल पॉल्यूशन द पास्ट प्रेजेंट एंड फ्यूचर ये बीस से छब्बीस अप्रैल तक होगा और आ, मेरी एक इच्छा है क्योंकि मैं मैं बार बार कह रहा हूँ मैं संस्कृत का विद्यार्थी हूँ ना गुरुकुल और पठन पाठन में ज्यादा विश्वास रखता हूँ ये टेक्नोलॉजी ठीक है मजबूरी बस मैं यहाँ खड़ा हूँ मुझे पता नहीं कितने लोग सुन रहे हैं लेकिन मेरे सामने जब हजारों की भीड़ होती हजारों भक्त होते सामने सॉरी भक्त मैं आध्यात्मिक आदमी हूँ मैं वो शब्द से निकल गया डेलीगेट्स होते विद्वत समाज होता तो शायद मैं और कुछ बोलता जो मैं इस टेक्निक पर नहीं कह पा रहा मैं ये चाहता हूं कि एक इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस हमने कर दिया दस हम ये कर रहे हैं लेकिन प्रोफेसर फ्लोरा प्रोफेसर याहिया बख्तियार प्रोफेसर राव साहब पता नहीं जो जो भी विद्वान हमसे जुड़े हुए हैं बत्तीस देशों के लोग तो हम एक ऐसा मौका तो उन्हें दें कि वो हमसे रूबरू हो हम उनके दर्शन कर सके और आमने सामने बैठकर गुफ्तु कर सके उनसे उनके विचारों से लाभान्वित हो सके मेरा ऐसा विचार मेरा था और इसको अंजाम देने का प्रयास हम कर रहे हैं अभी टेंटेटिव है संभावित है कि हम 11 से 13 अगस्त 2022 को ऑफलाइन इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस करेंगे ऑफलाइन ताकि इन समस्त विद्वत जनों को हम राजस्थान की इस धरा अरवल अलवर की उपत्यका अरावली की उपत्यका में बसे इस अलवर शहर में आमंत्रित कर सकें और उन उनकी मेजबानी कर सकें ये हमारे लिए सौभाग्य की बात तो ये इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस 11 से 13 अगस्त 2022 को प्रस्तावित है जो जिसका टॉपिक रहेगा मल्टी डिस्प्लिनरी अप्रोच टूवर्ड्स सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट एंड क्लाइमेट चेंज फॉर ए वाइएबल फ्यूचर तो मैं अभी से आह्वान करता हूं जो भी इस कॉन्फ्रेंस से जुड़े हुए हैं सभी जनों को कि वो हमारे इस आमंत्रण को स्वीकार करेंगे अभी से अपना प्लानिंग करके रखेंगे कि हमें इंडिया जाना है इंडिया में राजस्थान और राजस्थान में अलवर जाना है 
में रह ऐसा सभी सुधी जनों से आग्रह पुनः मैं मेरे वक्तव्य को माँ सारदे को प्रणाम करता हूँ और उन्हीं से आज्ञा लेता हुआ विराम देना चाहूंगा कि आप सभी लोगों का और मेरे विद्वान साथी राष्ट्रम साथी डॉक्टर एच ओ डी गणित डॉक्टर रविकांत जी और बॉटनिस्ट डॉक्टर लक्ष्मीकांत जी मैडम रसायन शास्त्री सुधा जी और ऑर्गेनाइजिंग सेक्रेटरी प्रोफेसर ममता जी और इनकी सहयोगी बटिया मुस्कान जी और टेक्निकल जिसके बगैर ये सब कुछ संभव ही नहीं था पुत्रवत शीतल और मीडिया प्रभारियों आप सभी का मैं तुम्हें अभिवादन करता हूँ धन्यवाद ज्ञापन करता हूँ जय हिंद जय Sir, I would like to hold my brother here. He is on the honor. Unveiling of training manual has to be done. So once the unveiling is done, we can we will be sharing the training manual with you all on the group. ट्रेनिंग इसको ओपन ओपन आज चैत्र कृष्ण पंचमी विक्रम संबत दो हजार अठहत्तर के साथ नक्षत्र हर्षण योग में आई एस टी टी पी फर्स्ट के प्रारंभ की घोषणा करता हूं और आई एस टी टी पी फर्स्ट के ट्रेनिंग मैनुअल जिसमें इस सप्त दिवसीय कॉन्फ्रेंस का आउटलाइन से About the colleges, about the rusha, about the keynote speakers, about the Rajasthan, about the Alwar. In Sapta, I this Subhav Sapta, Anavran Sapta. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Thank you so much, sir, for doing the honors. For your, your kind words, we value the insights. And guidance you provide to all of us, and your words of encouragement keeps us motivated throughout. Your presence is very, very important to us. What an inadequate thank all the speakers who have shared their videos about the training and sent their best wishes to us. In the, in the curtain raiser, which was, which was live, live on YouTube on 16th March 2022. We are glad, glad to have, have you with us. us. It can, can still be watched on our channel, channel. Environmental Toxicology. Do watch, like, and subscribe. Our biggest challenge in this new century is to take an idea that seems an abstract, sustainable development and turn it into reality for all the world's people. Kofi Annan says it, and it, make, it makes so much of sense in the present world. The Earth has enough resources for our need. But not for our greed. The most often quoted phrase by Mahatma Gandhi, our father of nation, and this portrays his concern for the nature and the environment. So, what is important? Let's look at our needs, not go out with the greed. Now it's time for our first keynote address to be delivered by Dr. Anil Kumar Changani, who is the head of the department. environmental science and director gandhian study center 
Maharaja Ganga Singh University of Bikaner, Rajasthan, India. Professor Dr. Anil Kumbar Chandani is an environmental ecologist, field biologist, has 20 years teaching experience and 25 years of research experience. Dr. Chandani completed MA in Educational Psychology and MSc in Zoology, PhD and DSc from JND University, Jodhpur. His fields of specializations are desert ecology, behavioral studies in mammals and birds, genetic biological studies with special reference to traditional environmental conservation practices, common property resources, environment planning, biodiversity, conservation and management, climate change, environment impact studies. His services as a member of the IUCN World Conservation Union and Conservation International Birds and Mammal Species Survival Commission Breeding Specialist Group from 2005 onwards. He has visited countries like USA, Japan, China, Thailand, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Nepal, Bhutan, and delivered lectures at various for forums as a visiting professor. By now, he has completed over 15 research projects. He published over 128 papers in international and national journals with A20 citations, with edge index of 18 and I10 index of 24. That's very impress impressive, Dr. Chandani, trust me. In last 20 years, he made and advised several national and international friends and documentaries. Professor Chandani received many laurels. Let me cite a few of them. He received second time Chaturvedi Award for writing best paper in the field of environment and wildlife by Indian Forester, Indian Council of Forestry Research and Education, Dehradun. He also awarded the Conservation International USA in 1998, Golden Jubilee Year of Independence, 1998 by State Government of Rajasthan, Conservation Award in 2004 from Ashoka Trust, Bangalore, and Marwa Ratna Award from Mehrangarh Museum Trust, Jodhpur, and Jodhpur Foundation Day in 2006. A state Award from Government of Rajasthan in 2007. Best Paper Award by Zoological Society of London, London in 2009. The Fatih Singh Wildlife Conservation Award in March 2020 for selfless and varied efforts toward the conservation and protection of wildlife in Rajasthan by Tiger Watch Foundation, London Award. Recently, Maru Ratna Award on 20 July 2020 by Desert Environment Conservation, Conservation Association, Jodhpur. Now, I would request Dr. Anil Kumar Chandani to start with the keynote address. Sir, you are very much welcome to you and we are very happy to have you. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes, sir, very much. I'm thankful to the organizer of this international training. Especially Professor Hukam Singh Ji, Professor Mamta Sarma for inviting me and giving me opportunity to share my field experience with the August gathering. Without wasting time, I'll straight go to the presentation. And how much time do I have now? Sir, you have one hour more. You can for long. Long. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, so the health of your health 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 Is it visible? Yes, no. I, I we can hear you, we can see you, we can't see your slides. Yeah, we can see the slides as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we can see. And my boss voice is on you. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much. 
as professor hokam sindhi very rightly pointed out that we people are leaving our culture and religion and traditional practices behind so i'm grateful to him to point out this issue and at the same time happy to share some of the similar kind of experience i have in the field since last 20 years as we all know that india is well known for its culture religion and man animal relationship throughout the world हमारे जो चौरासी करोड़ देवी देवता हैं वो किसी भी किसी एनिमल के साथ एसोसिएटेड हैं कई जगह एंड हमारा ही एक कंट्री है इन विच थ्री हंड्रेड एंड सिक्सटी थ्री पीपल I can't speak. I will request all the participants please keep your uh, mic on the muted mode. Wildlife sign, na environment of contamination, wildlife conservation, na. So please go ahead. Okay. So before going to the topic, I will ask you. Can you please ask your team to do the same? Yes, they can sir. Un- just... They can unmute anybody from there, from control room. Okay. So this is the real problem throughout the country nowadays: the environmental contamination, not only wildlife conservation, even human. They are facing a lot of problem of this environmental contamination of toxicity. so before going to those specific thing of toxicity and wildlife toxicology i'll just brief you that where are the toxicity is entering in our system and what are those setups where the wildlife and biodiversity is at risk and how man animal and human landscape area slowly slowly exposed to the environmental contamination this is what i'm just sharing my some of the field experience with you So as we know, Rajasthan has the variety of geographical conditions with the Aravallis, with Thar Desert, some of the Bindia areas, and some of the Chambal region areas, and Thar Desert. A different and unusual agricultural landscape and agricultural practices throughout the Thar Desert. Aquatic ecosystems. There are not many lakes in the Aravallis and traditional water bodies in Thar Desert. and urban landscape and urban ecosystem is very important if you take example of alwar you take example of jaipur bharatpur jodhpur bikaner anywhere in urban area you can see the many lot many birds and mammals and reptiles they are integral part of daily life rural ecosystem you go to any of the rural area whether it is thar desert whether it is vindhya whether it is aravalli you will find people always surrounded by wild animals birds mammals and reptiles and to protect these biodiversity the government of india has taken some initiatives just giving you a brief idea that biosphere reserves national park wildlife sanctuaries and conservation deserve for the same but if we see in rajasthan we have a different scenario than the protected area in thar desert if you can see the forest is about 1.8% whereas we have 5.6 that's a huge amount of land and area comes under common property resources which is known as oran gochers sacred groves or catchment area the water body and these are the some of the common traditional biodiversity conservation areas which has been known as common property uh, common property resources in general term otherwise they are known by a different nomenclature say oorans and gochers and fallow land and sand dunes and rolling land devil land waste lands agu jod python catchment area like this is an overview of oran if you have been to mukam as a vishnoi temple here and this is the oran also known as jambojika oran 
a separate room. And no forest official or no wildlife department is guarding this area. And this whole ecosystem is supporting a lot many birds, mammals, and reptiles. And they have also traditionally managed a water body over here, if you can see very clearly. And that supports the biodiversity of our reserve, local cultures. This is basically a pasture land for cows. Jordan Python, the Thar Desert, they are been known, the water body is known by different names, Nadis, Talab, and especially in Churu and Bikane. They have been known as Joan and Python. And the water body mostly used by the livestock for their drinking purpose and humans as well. And rainwater harvesting structures are very common throughout the third desert in Rajasthan. You can see very clearly the water body is here and this is the catchment area. It supports this water body and a runoff of water from the rain. These are the very peculiar and traditional rainwater harvesting structure you will find in all the rural and urban setups. And they are largely supporting the biodiversity. And if biodiversity today is facing a serious threat, it's purely because of these common properties associated with it. Sand dunes, they are the moisture retainer. They are the water bank of the car and the livestock. Some of the dry rivers, whether it is Gagar or Nuri, they are the dry rivers in Far Desert. Once they dry up, that land belongs to many of the birds, mammals, and reptiles that hunt them. Some forest enclosure available. There are some pestable ground, some of the seven pestable ground in Far And gravel lands. If you can see, it's a very rough kind of surface, very dry. Very small plants, very nutrient plants, which supports the livestock of the grasslands, fallowlands. Very typical practice in Far Desert. Fallowland has not been cultivated for three, four years, depending on the soil type. And every alternate year they change their shifting after three years. This is called fallowland practice. Mojak system and that supports the local flora and fauna. No doubt, our basic need is water in far desert and very pieces. Just to refer you all, today is the International Water Conservation Day. So, water is equally important for human survival as well as for the wildlife. Biodiversity. Survival of wildlife is largely depending on these common property resources as I was referring earlier. Because no tap water and canal water supply to these livestock and wild animals in the area where they are. So wherever you find the water bodies, large water bodies, it's been a kind of gene bank, gene pool of all local flora and fauna. And these common property resources serve as repository of biodiversity, they support biodiversity, they manage human and wildlife over distance, they preserve the native gene pool of the species, and they also support the rural economy. I don't go into for this slides. And as Professor Hukum Singh Ji was referring, that in this COVID, our common property resources serve throughout the area as backbone. As a result, the recovery rate of Rajasthan, especially Thar Desert, is high compared to the other parts of the world, and death rates are lower compared to other parts of the world. And purely because of our traditional practice, we used to preserve food, nutrients like care, sangri, guarpali, kachri, and people belong to the different part of Rajasthan. They also have some kind of preserved food in their kitchen for year round, and that triggers our immunity that completed our requirement of nutrition and that boosted our immunity. And just for your reference that we have severe lockdown during COVID between 2000 to 2022. And these two to four months were the severe lockdown, some areas maybe five months. No one can move out, out of the home, cannot go outside the home. 
cannot go to our brothers, our parents, our relatives. And this is for the first time in the human history we have been seeing so many stories, the notes about the plagues and Spanish flu. But people were allowed to go here and there as soon as they got an opportunity to have the most. But in this COVID, in this severe lockdown, I think none of us has faced problem of milk, butter, curd, yogurt, because our livestock system was so strong. They constant supplied us these dairy products. And that allow us to survive and allow us to maintain our so you can see there are thousands and plant species, more than 100 grass species, 2,000 animal species, and 35 million livestock and more than 30 million people supported by these common property resources we must understand. And they are the wildlife treasures as well. So wherever biodiversity ensures good ecology and which leads to the good village economy, that kind of simple thumb rule in any of the given area. So these common properties, they provide food, they provide fodder, gum, resin, fiber, firewood, fencing, touching material, non-edible oils, tannin, meat, wool, hair, what not. So they are the basically a life support system for the humans. And what is the key factor? Nature is the producer. Society is consumer. And our religion and culture are the main protector. In today's time, present political scenario, if you talk about the religion, people take it very otherwise. But till date, if we can see some of the common property resources were maintained because they have been named after local heroes and deities, like Deshno Koran, Karnimata Ka Oran, Ramdevji Ka Oran in Jaisalmer. Babuji ka oran, Harbuji ka oran, Pakal Mata ka oran in Jalor and Barmi. So lot many sacred groups named after the local heroes and god and goddesses. And so that is the main protector. Our religion and culture protected all these things we need to understand. And this is the triode where our biodiversity, our wildlife also exists. And I'm not going in detail, lot many around this area, these are the large areas we have been told. The Kumbhila right now is the state flower. This is a tree, Kedri. So many shrubs and grasses in this region. Supports livestock and human as well. So there are more than 15% of the mammalian species and of which 68 species of animals found in our desert. And mostly you can see wild animals, the herbivores and carnivores, they are always around humans. So that becomes very important that human landscape is the viable area or ecosystem or habitat for wild animals preservation. So whatever happened to us is going to happen to wild animals as well. You can see monkeys around the crop fields, things in the field of crops. And these are the scenario. This is the scenario where you can see if you go to any of the given ecosystem, any ecosystem, any rural orange or gochar area, you find wolves, wild boars, hyenas, jackals, blue bulls, black bug, and lot many reptile species and bird species. More than 400 species of bird reported from the and as you can see, people are always fine with the birds in their orchards and their households and always surrounded with the wild birds, whether it is peacock or butterflies or sparrow. We are celebrating Sparrow Day in urban areas. Sparrows are disabled. In the rural area, they are in good numbers. A lot many other bird species, insectivore birds and grain eating birds. So earlier it used to be a biological pace control in all these ecosystems and wildlife was naturally being treated by people. They have their specific role in the crop fields as well. So 
So we can see there are number of species owls. Bird is a very common earlier. Still very common in some of the area. Reptiles, more than 51 species of reptiles reported from this area. They are also potential pest control, especially for the termites. Going to see in the coming slides. Not many reptile species in part of the pollinators. They serve as pollinator as well. Not many food eating birds and not many insects. The most important taxa in the life is the pollinator, the insects, the butterflies, the honeybees. Because on the basis of that, our agricultural and horticultural production is going up and increasing. We are killing them through pesticides, through contamination, through poisoning. We are going to lose them. They are all useful insects, potential pollinators for us. So, because of the pesticide, their numbers are decreasing. Because of not many other reasons, their numbers are decreasing. And historically, we know the importance of these insects. So we have been given the conservation efforts to them. If you go to this no Goran, Karnimata temple, and if you go to any of the temple in the old cities of Rajasthan, you will find lot many paintings with the wild animals and reptiles and diamonds and chinks and black bugs. But simultaneously, you will find important insect texts also in those studies. So, biological pace control is nowadays dying out. Earlier, the arts used to be the pace of termite. The reptiles used to be pace of termite. We just take an example of termite, how termite treatment can killing our ecosystem. But earlier, it used to be the reptiles who can eat the termites, insects can eat termites. A lot many lizards they feed on the termites. So it's a natural way of pest control. <coughs> Elotis <coughs> and lot many birds who were feeding on the termites as well as on locusts. But nowadays, <coughs> with the excessive use of pesticide and system break of biological pest control, we have been killing habitat. And because of that, the birds have been disappeared. We are killing the habitat of reptiles, so animals and carotids and snakes and other species and frogs have been disappeared from the field. <coughs> they were also a potential pest controller. A lot many insects have been consumed by the insectivore cats. <coughs> major predator of termites. But with the change of land use pattern, where agriculture practices were changed, as I was referring that we used to have the fallow land practice, two, three years, we can keep half of the land without cultivating, it can be used by livestock and can be used by animals to graze and wild animals as well. And birds can be make a nest over here, peacock or fatties can make their nest here in this area, uncultivated area. But now we have the latest practice, a lot many technology, a lot many efforts and policies. So no space for any wild speech. That's the main reason. We don't have nowadays the natural biological space control in the crop fields. This change in land use pattern increases use of pesticides use of fungicide and this is the scenario at present in Thar desert this is how this contamination this toxicity is entering in the deep desert and killing our biodiversity killing our wild animals killing our small pollinators like creatures and of course we are receiving canal and how this originally works and how it works on the ground everybody knows this for almost a month together, we got the contaminated water in Jodhpur, in Bikaner, and the cities we are living. And these cause these contaminated water from all the industrial setups in Punjab, Haryana, comes to Kanar. So, press can warn, the scientists or a researcher can warn, they can give their data that this is the problem, these kind of heavy metals. And 
pollutants coming with this canal water, we should not. But people are using this in drinking, agriculture, and for livestock. These are the major pollutants and metals. So, this is all about the present scenario. People are remember when you see that we remind and it reminds us the Salman Khan. Okay, in 1998, leper and still suffering from food and going to That is a different scenario. On a few percent, Chinkara or black bug were killed by hunters. But a regular phenomena is going on. That is contamination and poisoning of wild animals throughout the habitat of wild animals. I just take a brief example of a case study of near Jodhpur. People or audience from Jodhpur, they know a place known as Dawa Roli. And it's a conservation reserve. You can see it's a polluted water and black buck is drinking this water and most of his duly flora is flourishing in this water. So this is just a Google image. This is the Salawas industrial area near Jodhpur. And you can see this is the effluent traveling through Banukala, through Kana, through Dawa, through Doli, right to the Barmel area. And this is a kind of canal and agricultural setup established by the people. And this was the potential area of wild animals as well as for birds and reptiles. And if you can take a close look, you can see people are just for the agriculture with this contaminated water. And this destroy the whole natural ecosystem in this area, the whole agricultural factories, the livestock factories and wild are dying every day. And no one is going to take care of this. See, this is the kind of water on ground, contaminated water from the industry. You can see this water has been spread throughout the village and area, whosoever comes in between 70 to 80 kilometers. All the villages are, all the black birds and chinkara are feeding in this area, losing their life. And with the presence of water, the contamination is increasing year by year. And this water has been consumed by the prosophis. So the prosophis Julie Flora doing its own work as an exotic species is clearing the ground of native species. Livestock suffering from this contaminated water. Chinks have been dying. Dogs have been surviving on those chinkara, on peacocks, on all kinds of creatures. And a total different scenario in that area. And if this process goes, continues for three, four, five years, I think we are going to lose entire tax of that area. And uh, there have been... <laughs> <laughs> Another example that many of us are involved in rooting I would request all new participants who are joining us, please keep your mic on the muted mode. Please unmute yourself. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. <laughs> and uh, we all know that there is another scenario going on on the ground with the extension of agriculture. People are becoming more and more greedy. As Dr. Hukum Singh Ji was saying and Dr. Mamta was referring that nature can fulfill the need of every creature in the earth. But they cannot fulfill the greed. And this is a fact. Now, if I have the latest agriculture technology, crop production with me, I need to control the waste. Because biological phase control has been killed by us, we have break those cycles. So now we have a variety of poisons in the market. So my question is that, how many rats have been killed by these poisonous substances? And in their advertisement, they say this poison is more than 50% successful, this is more than 70% successful. And who are the 50 or remaining 30% victims of this poison? So no study has been taken on this Biological phase control and other measures have been taken nowadays, the chemical phase controls. No study has been conducted by the people who engage in locust control with the spray, 
pesticide control on the insects, waste chemical control on the rodents. How much useful insects and animals have been killed by these pest control procedures? No study on that. And if we talk to those experts who have been in locust control, they say, Dr. Sir, we are carrying more than 2 lakh, 4 lakh gallons of paste or the poison with us. If we go and follow each and every scheduled species, then who is going to take care of these locusts? So our target starts at more 4 o'clock in the morning and we go with the tractors and sprinklers and spread all the poison with us to the locusts to control that population. In between, how many schedule one species died because of the consumption of those contaminated dead locusts? We don't know. How many great Indian buster died because of those? Don't know. The forest department can come out and can help us and identify the potential area of schedule one species. This is the area for great Indian buster. This is the area for pico. So if you cannot, if you can spray in a controlled way with the drone system or some other mechanism that will be useful that can protect those species in that area. And as we all know that contamination in vulture's life because of the cyclopinel that study has been conducted in Pakistan by Oaks Nielsen. This is a potential threat to many of the vulture species. And recently, just two days before, Chaya Gaon, Kamrup district, which is in Assam, there were 125 vultures that died because of the poisoning. And that poison has been kept by the pastoral on a goat to poison and kill the stray dogs. Unfortunately, they haven't come. And before that, the vultures of 125 numbers of long-billed white rump and cylinder bit all are the schedule one species and they died together. So that's the situation. We are innocently, accidentally introducing poison in our system without knowing the circumstances and the consequences. So this is the latest image of 125 vultures killed because of the poisoning. That poison has been given to control the dog population to a dead goat. And those carcasses have been eaten by these vultures and they died. And in absence of any testing, the authorities, the state and government and central government just burn them without knowing the facts, whether they really died because of that poison or there might be some other disease or contamination. Keeping that in mind, they just say, okay, it might be flu, it might be contamination, just burn them all. So that's the ground reality we are going with. Similarly, this poisoning is also killing GIB in many of the areas. The contaminated locust, face control, face treated insects always attracts these birds and they feed and die on spot. And it is a scheduled one species. At one time, government of India is spending crores of rupees to protect that species. So, the actual cost of population recovery efforts for any given species such as great Indian bustard, bald eagle in USA, Californian condor in USA, Los Angeles area, and long billed vulture, white drum vulture, and cylinder billed vulture has been huge. We cannot even imagine how much is the budget of our Rajasthan state has been spending by the people for Californian control population monitoring. Helicopter go for the searching if a Californian condor disappear. They have been satellite tagged. We cannot afford that. There is a huge cost. So what we can do, we can preserve the habitat. We can aware the people. We can educate the people. We can educate the system. So I have been to there. I have been to US and I have seen that Catalina Island, which has been separate island for the bald eagle breeding colony. And they are doing it for the captive programs. They are spending crores and crores of rupees. Helicopters have been given to the scientists to monitor these populations and helicopters were flying with the chicks of these birds. Wherever they go, they put satellite chip on each bird. Uh, it was in 2007 I was there. Or legal captive breeding program to understand the scenario, how we can use your expertise in our Indian vulture conservation program. 
similar thing with the California and Condor. I've been to Los Angeles, Ventura Islands, and these are areas to the West Coast. There are six sensors who are actively engaged 24 hours in condor breeding program. So earlier there used to be 30 condor left in the nature because their synapse said because the vulture population has been declined due to the lead used by the hunters and license has been given by government. So it is our responsibility to protect this creature. We cannot save dinosaur, it goes and disappear naturally. But species which is disappear because of the man-made problems, it is our responsibility to protect that. And that Senate approves crores of dollars every year to protect these birds and allow them. And each and every condor has been satellite tagged and they have been monitored on camera. No one is visiting them directly. So this is just to show you how much infrastructure and resource has been needed for go for a species recovery program or species conservation programs. Is it affordable for us or not? And as I was saying that each satellite tagged condor has been monitored with the camera and even when they lay in egg, each and every egg has been monitored 24 hours. And artificial setups has been established there in the zoos and breeding centers. And these are the release sites where they release the condor, which is in Petter Creek. But at the same time, after spending that much of huge amount, still they are feeding them regularly as pet bird. They are regular supply of water and food here, and they are all concentrated here. So if we are not initiating the same situation, along with the NC2 conservation program, we are going to face the same problem after 25 years in our vulture conservation program. So habitat protection and contamination in the food chain or in habitat need to be addressed in advance. When I was there, we have been trying to put some satellites to understand the vulture scenario here and some of the species movement in India. So we get satellites. Uh, these are the solar radioactive transmitters, almost 80 gram of weight, and we have been put it those to all the vultures in the zoos. And still we are not getting any success. He's my fellow colleague who did PhD with me, Jonathan Hall from USA. And with the Teflon belt, we put these rescued chicks uh, satellite tag and try to find out their home range. But interestingly, government of India yet not given us the permission to continue with this study. So, if a species disappears, no one is bothered in the system. They're all bothered about the people and politics. So, as a naturalist, as a teacher, it's our sole responsibility to come out with the facts and share it with the authorities and the masses. So, if a person like me who has been published almost more than 50 articles on vultures, I've been to all the top-notch institutes in the world, involved in the captive breeding program. After that, I'm not getting permission. My university has not been given permission. Still permission is pending with the central and state governments since it is a schedule one species. In the last five, six years, we have been trying and transmitters are with us. We are waiting for the permission. So if I'm facing this problem, what about a common man who is going to bother about these creatures? And why they are going to bother if the system is not been understanding this. So this satellite transmitter tells everything about the moment, the kilometer, the temperature, the feed habitat, where the bird moves. So these are the very costly and time-consuming efforts before it is too late to preserve our remaining taxa, the wild taxa. We must control this toxicity and these Poisoning happens in the nature through education, through proper legislation. And community is the best tool. If you can educate community about all these happenings in and around us, they are the best tool because Salman Khan has been trapped by the community. And mostly the human subsidy to the wild animals is going through the people, not through the government. 
for profit will be very limited effort in the rest of the past the centuries and the youth. But in our Indian scenario, especially in the Rajasthan, the people are more involved in conservation, wildlife and biodiversity is part of their life. And mostly the human subsidy in terms of crop, in terms of livestock, they are supplementing diet of herbivores and carnivores. So it is time to educate people and policy makers and visit each and every authority, whether it is panchayat in the rural area or in the urban area, or the ministers, or the politicians, and the NGOs, and just give them the idea that this is what happened on the ground and these are the points where we can check. So this is what we are doing regularly. We are even this today's workshop and this training is also in this that if we can educate and aware of our next generation, we can protect our environment. Best thing students go to the school and teach to the students school education. We need to involve all these traditional practices and the present scenario of environment. And we need to review our planning how we are going to control the pace, how we are going to do agriculture and whether we go for organic farming or not. So when government of India or state is giving 80% subsidy, my simple suggestion is that why not you give 100% subsidy to the farmer and ask him to go for organic. It will take you all the grains from you. So we need to think and we need to plan somewhere what is the best way of living. We are totally dependent on this canal, this contaminated water of Indira Gandhi canal. And we are destroying all our native species, all our native water bodies. Then who is going to serve us? As the political scenario is changing very fast, somehow the Punjab government can stop our water. Then we are going, we are going to face a lot of problems. Marwadi हमने यही तो किया कैनाल के भरोसे सारी की सारी अपनी वाटर बॉडीज को डिस्ट्रॉय कर दिया एनक्रोच कर लिया और बेतरतीब तरीके से एनक्रोच किया रूथलेस माइनिंग से उसको डिस्ट्रॉय किया कैचमेंट एरिया को एनक्रोचमेंट में पट्टे जारी कर दिए तो इस तरह से अगर हम करेंगे तो जिस कॉमन प्रॉपर्टी रिसोर्स जिस ट्रेडिशनल व्यवस्थाओं ने हमको इस कोविड में भी मदद किया अगर इसके बावजूद भी हम उसकी इंपॉर्टेंस नहीं समझ रहे तो शायद हमसे मूर्ख कोई नहीं होगा so there is an urgent need to understand and conserve the natural ecosystem around people. That is most important. And enabling government to implementing regulatory measures. Is tarah se koi kanda pani ya industrial waste pine ke pani mein mila sakta hai? Kanoon bane hue hain, monitoring system bane hue hain, lekin nahi hota kuch bhi. Aapas mein chief minister level tak ki meeting hai hoti hai, uske baujud bhi iske koi nirnay nahi ho pata hai. So ye humare system ki trasadi hai. Education and awareness, ये सब देख के लगता है लोगों को अगर educate कर दिया जाए, aware कर दिया जाए, तो शायद हम कहीं न कहीं पे वो बीच बीच कर सकते हैं, जो damage हो रहा है उसको control कर सकते हैं। और सबसे बड़ी चीज है कि हमें जो हमारे development के programs हैं, उनको review करना पड़ेगा कि हम canal का extension करें तो किस तरह से करें, agriculture का extension करें तो किस तरह से करें, pesticide का use करें तो कितना करें, traditional breed livestock की छोड़ या हम एनर्जी के नाम से इकोसिस्टम को डैमेज कर रहे हैं सोलर रेडिएशन से अगर सराउंडिंग का टेंपरेचर रेज कर रहे हैं लॉट मेनी सोलर प्लांट्स आर इंट्रोड्यूसिंग इन थार डेजर्ट इट्स बिकम ए एनर्जी हब आई थिंक वी आर हेडिंग नेशन वी आर टॉप इन द इंडिया टू जनरेटिंग सोलर एनर्जी बट द कॉस्ट हैज बीन पेड बाय लोकल्स बाय द बायोडायवर्सिटी द इंसेक्ट फ्लोरा हैज फोना हैज बीन डिसअपीयरिंग वेरी फास्ट Around any given, this is not the time to discuss all these things. I have a separate presentation how this green energy has destroyed our hard desert ecosystem. It destroyed all the habitats. So poisoning is a different thing and changing local scenario is different thing. We are increasing 3 to 4 percent temperature in and around every solar plants. That kills insects, that kills pollinators, the potential insects, useful insects. Many of my friends calling me from Jaisalmer that our date palm farm, farm has been flourishing with the female flowers, but male flowers are not there. Plus some of the plants, how we are going to survive if we are going to do this annually? 
they are hectares together area, lakhs of kilometers with the agriculture and horticultural production. So we need to think about all kind of a developmental activities we are heading for and review that and monitor that rapidly. This is what I want to say. And thank you so much. I'm thankful to the organizer of this training program, Visirat Government Autonomous College as well. I'm thankful to my vice chancellor, sir, who allowed me to interact with you in a very tight program and assignments given to me. Because I'm heading at present the Department of Environmental Science, Microbiology, Computer Science, and since our one of fellow colleagues has become examiner or onko center superintendent se kaam bana diya gaya hai aur Raja Ram ji ko bhi CEO ka bhi kaam de diya gaya hai to the department of history ka bhi chart mere paas hai so i'm thankful to our authorities and i'm specially thankful to all the participants for listening to this thank you so much dear dr chandani i thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time from your busy schedule I know you had a meeting with the vice chancellor just before coming here, and even panicking that you should be in time with us. Thank you so much, and you are our first keynote speaker, and we really appreciate that. Your presence and wise words help to magnify our cause in the in the best possible way. All the thanks to you for your enlightening word that inspired so many people out there, including me. Thank you so much for sharing beautiful pictures. They reminded me of Bikaner, and Bikaner has a very important place in my heart because I started my services from Government Amos College, Bikaner, and my best friend still lives in Bikaner. She is also associate professor in political science. And uh, who knows more than you and me that how life is uh, tough in desert, and every drop of water counts. You also reminded me of Kandi Mata at Deshnok and Kerasagri Vegetable, which I really miss in Delhi as now resident of Delhi. I am um, also a bit terrified by hearing that factories are throwing their efforts in IGMP. Because IGMP is a life saver for so many villages and cities in Bikaner and Ganga Nagar district. I agree with you that unawareness and no education is the biggest. Thing. Thank you so much for being. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. जवाहरलाल्स ICCR chair of government of india as a visiting professor in cambodia in 2016 he was the jury member of world sanskrit award committee iccr government of india member of executive court and academic council of jnu he was the odisha state coordinator of non formal sanskrit education under mhrd government of india professor rao edited and authored Twenty-two and many research papers in Sanskrit and Pali, Hindi, Telugu, and English languages, and now working on Ramayana Indic studies, including Sanskrit inscriptions of Cambodia. He has received many awards and certificate of honors from various institutions in India and abroad. Now I would like and request Dr. C. Upendra Rao to start with his keynote address. Dr. C. Upendra Rao. Thank you. Ah, uh, Mamta Sharma ji, thank you very much for inviting Thanks, me. Thank you, sir. Such a pleasure to see you. Thank you very much. I hope you can listen to me. And uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that uh, uh, today, Rajarshi Government Autonomous College, situated at Alwar in Rajasthan, is doing the international short-term training program. on the topic very relevant topic the recent advances in environmental technology toxicology and wildlife conservation i consider this topic is very very important the recent advances in environmental toxicology and wildlife conservation so as my previous speaker was telling very very important and very very fascinating lecture he was giving uh i am very much uh, happy to participate uh, in your uh, this uh, training program because uh, 
this environmental issue is very very important issue we cannot ignore it <clears throat> today we have several other aspects but we had to come back to the environmental issue that is very very important because we have to live on the earth today's man has learned to construct beautiful buildings with all comforts in them but being entangled in the net of samsara man cannot realize how such technological developments are constantly polluting the environment factories and the discharged gases from vehicles and uh, increasing <clears throat> and uh, they are increasing factories are increasing the discharged gases gases from the vehicles are increasing for some days due to corona period uh, when uh, life has stopped you might have noticed that there was no sound pollution there was no pollution also at that time but again everything has started sound pollution and the environmental pollution so they are increasing and as a result we cannot receive pure and clean air <clears throat> even oceans are polluted with the marine food and oils and the industrial waste is going to the oceans in ancient days if you compare because the uh, we are dealing with the indic studies and often we are dealing with the ancient uh, situation how our ancient india was in ancient days as evident in the texts of buddhist and vedic literature man used to live happily in the forests and villages there was a considerable growth also there were buildings also there were townships also our society was much developed society in ancient india but still they had very good environmental consciousness they did not pollute environment like today we are polluting today i wonder what kind of scientific progress our social development man has achieved the entire atmosphere is going to be damaged by the name of science but in the olden days green forests and species living there could experience immense peace and bliss even today we have uh, such environmental awareness and environmental happiness in our campus we have so many birds and animals here we are also enjoying sometimes such an environmental bliss here but if you see the outside in the town it is very very hazardous today we are using chemical fertilizers also because we don't have chance to escape from the these pollutions today we are using the chemical fertilizers for more growth and quick results though chemical fertilizers increase crop production <clears throat> but their overuse has given us many bad results what are the bad results hardened soil decreased the fertility strengthened the pesticides polluted air and water released the greenhouse gases thereby bringing hazards to human health and environment <clears throat> not only indians egyptians romans babylonians and early germans are all recorded as using minerals and manure to enhance the productivity of their farms in ancient times we used to use the manure and uh, minerals for the enhance of productivity of our farms even in other areas also other regions like egyptians also used to do like that the use of wood ash as a field treatment became widespread in ancient india <clears throat> if you explore the agricultural system in ancient india you will understand that in ancient india our ancestors never used these chemical fertilizers 
we get so many evidences in pali literature we get so many evidences in sanskrit literature how they used to do this uh, uh, agriculture we have in fact vrksha uh, uh, shastra krushi shastra also krushi shastra we have if you see the buddhist literature buddhism has much to offer in the quest to answer the environmental crisis buddha has accepted the importance of the forest and the peaceful life he liked the solitude solitude means loneliness and isolation he like as a most favorable condition for the highest attainment in the life he accepted the isolation solitude loneliness he advised to be lonely therefore he chose uh, he himself if you see his life he himself chose uruvela forest and niranjana river as the most suitable places for his meditation <laughs> green forests provide us with beneficial things for survival if you see the ancient literature the entire literature is full of the description of the green forests first semester me so these green forests provide us with beneficial things for survival the theraga theragadha for example take a text is very famous in pali literature and also theri gadha they are all these these both small texts are part of kudak nikaya of sutta pitaka they are the part of pali literature they are unique in this aspect <clears throat> buddhist monks peacefully meditated with their inner pragna and like a mountain in the forest they never moved to the various disturbances of the world if you want the original gatha i can also quote rukha moolam vanissaya mundo sangati paruto panyaya uttamo thero upati so vachayati so in this way you can find the description ancient buddhism in india has reached the status of ecological religion i am limiting uh, even though we have various aspects but i am limiting it to the pali and buddhist literature the relationship between the buddhist ideas and the natural world can be can be scrutinized within the three contexts buddhists have treated nature as a teacher in buddhism nature was respected as a spiritual force and as per the teachings of buddha nature became the way of life for the buddhist monks but yet one can never find environmental movement in any text of buddhist literature simply why because simply because it wasn't needed at the time just like we do not have any human rights there is no human right there is no crisis of human we had the description of human dignity likewise if you see our ancient literature there was no any environmental movement because that was not needed people had a strong connection with the nature in those days just to see the life of buddha all significant events in his life occurred in the countryside and uh, they are associated with the trees and forests buddha's life is full of environmental awareness buddha's birth at lumbini lumbini was a forest as his mother took hold of a branch of a sala tree this early experience of see that was uh, that is how he was birth he was born in lumini forest and with the association of the association of the tree his early experience of meditative absorption beneath the rose apple tree and his enlightenment beneath the bodhi tree and he is parinirvana between the two shala trees parinirvana means is a death 
Mahaparnirvana has happened in Kusinara. We say Kusinagara in Sanskrit, but in Pali Kusinara we say. It took place in Kusinagara between the two twin sala trees. Twin sala trees. Sala trees are very tall. There was a sala grove in Kusinagara. He chose that place because Buddha knows everything about his Mahaparinirvana in advance. Today, man turned to be ignorant of the mutual interdependence of all processes of the world. Interdependence. Man has forgotten that man thought that man, due to the advancement of the science, man started thinking that he can do everything through the help of the science. That is the main problem today, I am understanding. He has forgotten the interdependency between the forest, interdependency between the nature and human life. By harming nature, man is harming himself. Like a famous line in Sanskrit, Dharma eva hato hanti dharmo rakshati rakshita. If you destroy the dharma, dharma will destroy you. So, in the same way, we can say that Vruksha eva hato hanti vruksho rakshati rakshita. We can say. Trees protect men if he protects trees. So, in this way, if you see, there are so many evidences in ancient literature. Jataka Pali. Jataka is very famous. Jataka stories are very famous. But very few people know that Jataka is a part of Pali literature. Jataka Pali contains the information about the peaceful rural life of ancient India. People nurtured the various animals, especially cows. The herdmen, the headsmen, could recognize each cow based on the marks on it. That was the uh, association with the nature. I am giving all examples. The headsman could recognize each cow based on the marks on it. Can you recognize today like that? Villagers used bronze, wood and fruit shells as their vessels, unlike plastic used in the present day generation. Loska and Takha Jataka state that villagers established schools and uh, building residential quarters for the teachers in a peaceful area amidst the forest trees, not in towns, amidst the forest trees. They used to build beautiful buildings amidst the forest trees. A monk should satisfy by residing beneath the tree. See, becoming monk is not monk, Buddhist monk, Bauda Bhikshu, it was not a joke. He has to take the precepts before that. Panchashila, Dashashila, he has to accept. One of them is he should be ready to live in the forest, not in the towns. Living all luxuries. Likewise, our sannyasis, vanaprasthas, also in Vedic tradition, had to accept the forest living. So this is all association with the nature. Monks loved the mountains because they used to live on the mountains. You can find today, we have so many viharas are unearthed. Wherever you dig on beautiful mountains, the mountains which are situated on the banks of the oceans, they have chosen such a, such a places. You can find in near Vishakapatnam such place and many other places also in Vedisa, in other Chhattisgarh, other places also. Many viharas are coming out and those viharas are situated in beautiful places, peaceful and uh, excellent places because monks loved the mountains. They used to reach beautiful mountains for quest for the quiet meditation in solitude. They relished at the sight of a large cluster of giant trees. And they relished the herds of the animals, 
lovely creepers, birds, flowers, and peacocks. All these were the, all these things, all these birds and trees were enhancing the peace and beauty of forests situated on the mountains. So everywhere, if you see, even in Sanskrit literature, it's a full of uh, environmental awareness. The why I'm quoting again and again the ancient literature. You see, that was India where they had full environmental awareness. They never used the fertilizers, chemical fertilizers also. They never polluted the towns. So that was our culture, basic culture. Now, no need to invent any new inventions. See, if you simply follow your culture, all these things will be followed. So we have many evidences like that. In uh, Talaputta Thera Gatha, we find a noble dream of a Talaputta. Noble dream of a Talaputta. He says, he says that he dreams. He says that when shall I alone wander in the caves of the mountains and treat all things as impermanent. His dream is like that. I would like to wander alone in the mountains and treat entire the world as impermanent. Anitya, basically. He says in Pali, Kadanuham Pabbata Kandarasu Ekakiyo Adhutiyo Vihasam Anichayo Sabbabhavam Vipassam Tamme Idam Tamnu Kadabhavisati. When can I get this? When can I get this opportunity? He's not dreaming for the luxuries. That is why in Pali literature, Ramaniyani Aranyani. Natatta Ramati Jano means uh, is very clearly said in Pali literature. These forests are very beautiful. But the common man cannot understand the greatness of the forest. Natatta Ramati Jano means common man cannot understand the greatness of the forest. Because common man understands. He will get the enjoyment in the malls. He will get the enjoyments like in Kannada place in Delhi, which is completely polluted. That is why common man can, it is said in the BC 6th century, common man cannot understand the importance of the forest. So the same monk feels in other gadha that when after hearing the melodic sounds of the peacocks and other birds, Shall I awake during the morning in the forest? He further says that now enough of the household life. And thus he feels to depart in the forest. So this is how they understood the importance. Now, now tell me, are we progressing or regressing? This was the situation in ancient India. So in every aspect, in the aspect of the linguistics, in the aspect of the environment awareness, if you see our ancient life, the problem is people nowadays are not studying the ancient sciences, ancient literature. On the name of modernity, we are forgetting our own ancient literature. That is why you don't know what is what was in India. But if you, fortunately, sometime go back to our ancient literature and read all these things, you will understand that we are not progressing, we are actually regressing. We find plenty of such gathas in Thera Gatha alone. In Angulama, the in Angulamala, the Angulimala is very famous. I think most of you know that Angulimala. He was a very big thief and then changed, transformed into a Buddhist monk with the influence of the Buddha. In Anguli, there, there, was, there is a separate uh, Gatha in literature, Angulimala Thera Gatha, it is. We find in that Angulimala Thera in Gatha that Angulimala says, he himself says, such a cruel thief, he says, what he says now, you listen. I remained under the trees of forest and caves of the mountains. That's Angulimala says. Now I would like to remain under the trees of the forest and the caves of the mountains, all alone. So in the same text, we find that Aniruddha Thera says that it may be village or forest, forest, down or up, but the place where Arhans wander is a beautiful one. 
So in this way, if I go on quoting, there are several, several examples. That's why just now I said that uh, he, he himself, he points out that the ordinary man cannot release the beautiful forest because he is constantly searching for sensual pleasures. In contrast, a scholar with dispassion, vairagya, can find a great deal of peace and happiness in the forests. The Gadha is like this. Gameva yediva ranye, ninneva yediva thale, yatha arahanto viharanti, tambhumi ramaniyakam. But exploiting nature with the approach of resource management leads us into many difficulties. Mainly, we lose ethics and humanity today. Therefore, we are involved in animal slaughter to keep the kitchens of the world constantly supplied with the meat. In Buddhism, also, it is also said very clearly in Panchashila, first Panchashila, you know what is that? Pana, Pipata, Veramani, Sikhapatam, Samadhyan. I take oath that I would not kill any animal, single animal. But animal awareness also, not only forest awareness. We are involved, today we are involved in animal slaughter to keep the kitchens of the world constantly supplied with the meat. And killing of the peaceful sea creatures by rich countries like Japan and USA and many other countries in Southeast Asia, terribly they eat all sea products. They all have right to live on the earth, not only human beings. But Buddhism stands just opposite to this. Not only Buddhism, even our Vedic religion also stands opposite to this. Buddhism advocates, Buddhist literature, you can find that Buddhism advocates that harmonious interaction between beings and nature. This is very, very important point. Harmonious interaction between the beings and the nature. Not only Pali literature, if you find the Sanskrit literature, if you find the Kumara Sambhava in Sanskrit literature, you'll find the great description of you see the fifth canto of Kumara Sambhava, where Parvati used to live in the forest. You see that you see, read the chapter completely with full of environmental awareness. How Par Parvati was used, used to live in the forest and hermitage. It's a beautiful description. And every step you will get the environmental awareness in Kumar Sampavan. Everywhere Uttaranamacharita, you take any, any literature, any, any book, any drama or any poem. So in this way, if you see our literature, our ancient India, that should stand as inspiration for today's uh, uh, human beings, people, because uh, we are not... Uh, having time to think all these things. We are uh, continuously polluting environment and that's why I'm uh, very happy that uh, you have chosen this uh, wildlife conservation topic. This is very, very important. And uh, people should get awareness on such things. I appreciate uh, all of you. I appreciate uh, all faculty members of uh, Rajarshi Autonomous College. I appreciate your principal, Hukam Singh Ji, Professor Hukam Singh Ji, and also the conveners, Dr. Mamata Sharma, Muskan, and all other faculty. And uh, I wish. Uh, your efforts in this direction will be successful and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, dear Dr. Rao, first I must tell you, you are a family to us. Stay with us and stay, give us your blessings to us. 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for giving me, giving up your valuable time to talk on ISTTP one. It was a great pleasure to hear you to talk about saving the environment. It was quite apparent how every single person, including me here, was engrossed in your talk. And trust me, there's so much more to learn from your knowledge and experience. It was a great, it was a treat hearing you as always. You very rightly said that we need clean air to breathe, land to live, and water to drink. And stress on the biodiversity is quite visible. Pesticides and fertilizers are killing uh, Earth. Ancient literature has a lot about environmental protection, and it teaches men to live in collaboration of environment. Thank you so much, and we look forward to hear more from you. Thank you so much, sir. Now it's time for our third keynote uh, address to be delivered by Dr. S.J.S. Flora. Dr. S.J.S. Flora is ex-director, National Institute of Pharmaceutical Education and Research, Raiburi, Lucknow Campus, UP. He also held an additional charge of Naipur Mohali for one and a half year. He got his PhD from Indus Industrial Toxicology Research Center, ITRC, Lucknow, and was a postdoctoral research associate at Utah State University, USA. He served for nearly 29 years at Defense Research and Development Organization, DRDO, at Gwalior, India. His most highlighted contribution includes development of a new drug for treating cases of arsenic poisoning. The drug was approved by Drug Controller General of India in 2014 for human trials. Phase one human trials of the drug was completed by Cadilla Pharma. He has published about 350 research papers, 14 patents to his credit, and there were more than 15,000 citations of his work. Dr. Flora has a scientific edge index of 61 and served as an associate editor or member of the editorial board of nearly 29 international journals. That's very, very impressive, Dr. Flora. He has edited five books and a handbook of arsenic toxicology and a handbook of biological warfare preparedness are published by Elsevier, USA. He was awarded prestigious DRDO Scientist of the Year Award for his contribution, first indigenous drug for arsenic poisoning. He also was conferred with the prestigious Dr. Kailash Nath Karju Award of Madhya Pradesh government. Shakuntla Ami Chand Award of Indian Council of Medical Research, Society of Toxicology and Academy of Biotechnology and Pharmacy Lifetime Achievement Award in Toxicology and Pharmacy. He was honored with Professor S. D. Pandey Oration Award, Dr. Govind Achari Oration of Indian Pharmacological Society in 2010, Dr. R. Nath Memorial Oration of Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Chandigarh. DRDO Technology Day Oration, Professor R.C. Dalela Oration of Academy of Environmental Biology. Sir, we are so much delighted to have you with us. Now I would request Dr. S.J. Flora to start with this keynote address. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mbanta. It's uh, wonderful to be back uh, again uh, in the, with you, uh, your institute. Uh, I gave a talk about I think a few months back, and uh, uh, Mamta asked me that I, should I include the same talk for my today's talk, but uh, I thought it is a good opportunity for me to talk about something new, uh, particularly for the benefit of uh, uh, young blood, and uh, particularly also keeping in view the present scenario uh, all over the world, uh, what is going on, and uh, one where we are at the verge of Perhaps, perhaps, and I feel that I, I pray to Almighty that it doesn't happen. World War Three. So, con keeping that in into the context, and perhaps I thought that uh, there is a need for the young mind to be aware of. First of all, let me make it very clear that I am not here. I am not here to frighten people, or I want to uh, make uh, any 
remarks perhaps which may create some uh, controversies or have a but the question is only that yes there is need to be aware of what is actually going on so since i have a background of drdo and um, there is a lot of talk these days about chemical warfare agents and uh, most of the youngsters perhaps who are not very much familiar with science scientific terminology or maybe they are at the early stages of their research career uh, i've thought that perhaps uh, a brief introduction uh, to what is chemical warfare and how we should be ready how we should be prepared for this uh, perhaps uh, is a fear but uh, there may be a, a perhaps maybe not now maybe after many years there will be uh, a possibility that chemical warfare may be used between the two uh, neighboring countries so it's it's a it's a distinct possibility that there may be some some sort of chemical warfare because the days of conventional war when i say conventional war i mean a war which is being fought with tanks missiles uh, with the uh, what you call it uh, aircrafts fighter aircrafts perhaps there will be a time when the such type of war will not be there and there will be a war which will be fought using chemical warfare or using biological warfare and uh, but when i say biological warfare again uh, uh, my uh, i'm pointing to uh, use of viruses there is one virus which is going around covid-19 perhaps there is a lot of talk that it is intentional and whether it is been uh, it has happened like that or it has been used by some uh, countries which has which are not supposed to use it but there is a possibility there is always a possibility that a a a, a country who is hostile to us can use biological agents as a warfare agents or there is a possibility that some chemicals can be used as a warfare agent so uh, future wars are i'm not referring to the current war which is going on between two countries they were conventional tanks missiles and all they have been used but there may be a possibility that a country may use such type of chemicals or even biological agents to fight their cause okay so the, then i thought that perhaps this will be a topic and i'm just here to uh, provide the audience with some basic introduction keeping in view my background uh, i'll just be using my screen for uh, some of the slides which i'll be showing just give me one second just one second i'm just having some technical issue i'll just upload my slides and then sir no worries take your time sir okay Mamta, can you see my slides now? No, sir. We cannot. Hello. Not visible, sir. It's not uh, visible. Okay, just one second. It just started. Then I don't know where did it go. It, it is not visible. Okay, one second. Slide is not visible. Sir, please take your time. Yes, ma'am. We are working on it. Please keep patience. We are working on it, ma'am. Thank you. 
can you see me now can you see the slides now yes it's just starting yes yes we can see your slides sir okay great so now the my topic which is a very preliminary topic just to make uh, my young colleagues aware of what is chemical warfare i'm not covering the biological warfare part because this is a topic in itself so we'll be sticking only to the chemical warfare what is chemical warfare and what are the chemicals how toxicology is being used as a tool for fighting a war now i'll start with a some very basic information for uh, students perhaps who are not very much uh, familiar with the science see we are every day from starting from morning till evening uh, we always constantly interact with chemicals in nature which are been uh, either they, they are natural chemicals or they are being made by human beings uh, whether it's a food whether it's a water whether it's a environment whether it's a air so we constantly have to interact with chemicals every day and all chemicals they are now they are have the ability to be toxic there is absolutely not even a single chemical in the world which is not toxic when i make this statement uh please make sure it's not the chemicals which are toxic but it's the dose the dose which you give is toxic so if you see the my next slide you can see the vitamin c everybody knows a common man even knows the vitamin c is a useful chemical and it's been uh, people always say that you take more of uh, vitamin c it is there in uh, uh you can in lemon it is there in the oranges it is there in the even uh, in the, most of the fruits which you take vitamin c but if you look at the bottom side of this vitamin c you can find it out very little amount of vitamin c is required for all biochemical activities which is going on in your system in your body so for your body system you require little bit, little bit of vitamin c then the minimum requirement for a human being a normal human being per day is 50 mg of vitamin c is required for physiological function physiological function mean your body uh, does lot of physiology phys uh, from early morning till evening so for all the physiological function we require 50 mg is the daily requirement of vitamin c now if you got cold you might have seen that if you go to a doctor where doctor will say you take a lot of vitamin c or rather he will give you a tablet of 500 mg of vitamin c along with a drug depending upon your symptoms or your severity of the problem he will give you but any drug which he will give along with that he will give 500 mg of vitamin c which is required for common cold but the moment you exceed 500 mg of vitamin c and if you take 5000 mg of vitamin c it will become toxic uh it will form kidney it stones in the kidneys so you know and a very low amount vitamin c is required for your biochemical activities biochemical activities means whatever is happening inside the body whether it's an enzyme activity whether it's a, any other activities in your system then there is a physiological requirement of vitamin c in the daily requirement is 50 mg then if you have some symptoms some diseases there like common cold doctor prescribe 500 mg but if you exceed or you take lot of vitamin c it may lead to stones in the kidney likewise uh it is just the statement which i made at the beginning of my lecture that we must breathe drink and eat chemicals to stay alive and this chemicals can be food this can be water this can be juices this can be anything the air we breathe is a mixture of chemicals you all know that there is a number of gases are there in the air you all know it oxygen carbon dioxide little bit on uh, carbon monoxide sulfur dioxide there are lot of so but the quantity which is required uh, is amounts to whether it is useful whether it's a toxic water milk and beverages they are all chemicals so our food contains a variety of complex chemicals so you cannot avoid a chemi chemical uh, in your daily life now 
there is a myth. People normally say that the natural chemicals, they are safe. It's not that. Natural chemicals, you know, if you had a snake bite, the snake venom is a natural chemical. Snake forms that venom. So that venom is a natural, uh, naturally formed chemicals, but it's a highly toxic. It may lead to death. The same is the chemical which is being formed. If you have a, a bite or is a scorpion uh, has, uh, has given you a bite, it may lead to even death. One, there, is a, there are a number of plants which are toxic and uh, people normally avoid, even the, even the animals, they avoid such type of plants which may be toxic. So it's not always necessary that all the natural chemicals which people say they are not non-toxic. Similarly, people say that all the synthetic chemicals, they are toxic. It's not the case. There are a number of synthetic chemicals, including drugs. If you can see that washing powder, there are many other chemicals. You, have, you can see the pictures. I don't have to describe those pictures. That there are a number of chemicals which are being man-made. So these are the man-made chemicals but they are not necessary, they are always harmful. So what I mean to say, and I again repeat, it's a dose. It all depends upon how much exposure you have got to this. That, that justifies whether you are having a toxicity or you are not, it is not toxic. So the statement which I would like to make is that there, there are no safe chemicals, even the water, H2O, it's a, it's, people say it's a safe. No, if you take a lot of water, it, even, it can lead to toxicity. So there are no safe chemicals. There is only a safe way of using chemicals. You have to protect yourself. You have to restrict your doses. You have to dis, uh, restrict the intake of those chemicals to a certain limit, which is a prescribed limit. I'll talk about these prescribed limits which, which, uh, in a later slides. So chemicals which they cause their effect by interacting with the cells. So now I'll go a little deep into the cell. Uh, you can see that these chemicals, they interact with cells. Cells are, are those things, I mean, which are number of cells, make molecules, that the number of molecules makes organs and some, this is, this is the way. So these are all chemicals, they cause the effects by interacting with the cell. And that cell functions are changed. So there is a normal cell function, which is a prescribed. You take in, uh, oxygen inside, it will go and you go, it, it will uh, interact with certain particular part of the cells and they will form hemoglobin and hemoglobin. So this is what I'm trying to sell uh, to the normal students. I mean, if students who are not very much familiar with the scientific terminology, that the cell functions, there are a normal cell functions and you, and then, once these chemicals enter in a certain amount, there are certain chemicals which are required by the cells to function normally. And once the limit exceeds, then it changes the function of those cells. And then once the, it changes the function of the cells, it becomes toxic or sometimes it leads to any disease. This is what po the point which I'm trying to make, the dose. So the, what I said at the beginning, it's the dose which determines whether a chemicals will be bad, beneficial or toxic. Just I'm giving you again few examples like aspirin. So aspirin in a dose of 300 to 1,000 milligram, depending upon the severity of your disease or the problem which you are facing, if you take 300 to 1,000 milligram, it's a beneficial. But if you take more than 300 to 1,000 milligram per day, this is why doctors always say, that you should not take do any chemical, any uh, medicine, self-medication, which, which we people normally talk about, because you never know that how much quantity is required. And uh, this quantity is ranging between 300 to 1000 milligram. A doctor will not, because this all has been, these doses has been decided after a lot of research. And uh, it, it, the, the research decides that how long the chemicals is going to stay in your body that suppose there is a molecules or a, a drug which is S, X drug is there. So doctor looks for this kinetic that how long this drug remains in the system. And once it's suppose there is drug which remains in the system for six hours. So then only that doctor will prescribe, take this drug after six hours. 
you have to take three doses in a day and because he decides the dose because the that drug remains in the system for six hours and then it go, goes out of the system and then you have to take another dose depending upon mm -hmm. the disease or the severity of the problem similarly vitamin a 5 5000 units per day is the prescribed by doctors it they, they normally never exceed these limits and then if you take 50000 unit per day it become toxic so what i gain and again i am emphasizing on a very common fact that all substances can be poisonous if you take an excess amount and excess amounts are decided by the researcher that you can see any drug if you go and uh, buy a drug for any disease which you have if you look very carefully on the uh, bottle you will find out that this they will always mention that this drug is toxic at certain level it is it is mandatory for drug controller general that all the drug manufacturer they should write that this drug is toxic at this table so this is all being decided by the what you call it uh, research now this is what a very typical example of how you classify a toxic chemicals okay now if the oral ld50 of a drug is less than 0 0.05 suppose there is a drug or there is a chemical i won't go for drug now i'll say that if there is a chemical a researcher has found out that's LD50. LD50 is lethal dose 50. I'll describe what is LD50 in a later slide. If the LD50 is 0 0.05, it is a poisonous. If it is point between 0 0.05 to 0.5, it's a warning sign. So what you mean to say that this chemical, particularly this chemical is a highly toxic chemical because this LD50 is 0 0.05. It's a very what you can call it then again it's a caution is 0.5 to 5 and if it is more than 5 it's a just safe same is for the dermal dermal means skin 0.2 is poison 0.2 again so if lc50 is this eye effect corrosive is a poison so these are how the classified class 1 class 2 class 3 and class 4 the safest one now this is actually i should have shown this slide at the beginning now, no observed effective level is what you call that if this is a particular if there is a drug or a chemical which says that I know IEL of this chemical is 50. It means to say that at a dose of 50 milligram, this drug will have no effect. It is safe. Then comes LD10, lethal dose 10. Lethal dose 10 means suppose lethal dose 10 of a chemical is 100 milligram 100 milligram that has been reported it means that at a dose of 100 milligram it will kill 10 percent of the population ld50 ld50 means at a particular dose it will kill 50 percent of the population and similarly at a dose of ld90 if there is a ld90 of a particular chemical is being given it means at that particular dose it will kill 90% of the population. So this is how you de describe lethal doses. Now I'm slowly coming to chemical warfare, which was perhaps was my original topic. Now you can see the LD50 values. Now you understand the lethal dose 50. A lethal dose 50 means these are all chemical terminology or scientific terminology, which is being used by toxicologists. Now LD50 is a dose which kills 50% of the population. To describe my point, ethyl alcohol which is a commonly it is called ethanol the ld50 of ethanol is 10000 mg per kg so if you give 10000 mg per kg of ethanol to some it, it will kill 50% of the population sodium chloride which is commonly called salt 4000 mg per kg 4000 per kg means 4 g per kg is ld50 if you even the salt is toxic that is what the point which i'm trying to make sodium cyanide 10 milligram you you can see that once you go to the very toxic very commonly known toxicants you will see that how it comes down uh, the dose comes down ld50 dose comes down nicotine which is a highly toxic 
it's a one milligram per kg can kill one kg means for a 70 kg of person a normal weight of a common man is considered as 70 kilogram so for 70 kilogram 70 milligram dose is good enough to kill 50 percent of the population now on the bottom side you can see there are few names which are being written sarin soman which vx ricin botulinum toxin these are commonly called chemical warfare agents these are the chemicals which are being used by the enemy to kill the if they are invading any country they can use this type of chemicals to kill or to incapacitate the army sarin is a, a again a chemical which has been man made chemicals it is called nerve agent it can have a devastating effects on ear nerve you can see the picture on the right side this picture is being taken from uh, a tokyo sub uh, metro station suburb uh, it, what has actually happened a gas was used it was sarin gas which was used in that metro station and uh, there were a lot of mortality happened long back i think it happens about 30 40 years back when some, some a person of a wicked mind uh, what he did he used a drug uh, the sarin gas uh, in that uh, suburb stations and uh, killed almost i think mm -hmm. um, there were a number of casualties i don't remember the, how many casualties were there so these chemicals are being used by the terrorists or by uh, countries which are hostile countries now you can see the soman the LD50 of soam, sarin is 0.2 milligram. You can see a very small amount can be deadly. Soman, 0 0.08, even less than that. VX, 0 0.02. Ricin, ricin, I think you mo most of you will be surprised to know the ricin uh, is a chemical which is being derived from a very common plant product. You know, I think most of you might be knowing ratti. It says red color of uh, where mostly I think uh, you might have seen uh, in uh, uh, a, a very f farmers might come it's a shrub type of things this ricin is derived is a chemical which is derived from that ratti which is red in color I don't know the actually the common name which is used for ricin but this chemical is being derived from and you can see that LD50 of this 0.001 Botulinum toxin, again it's a nerve agent, 0 0.0001. So these are chemicals which can be used by terrorists, they can be used by enemy countries uh, against us. Now this is how it enters, there are number of entry of these chemicals and every chemical has different type of entries into the system like mouth, normally we use the terminology oral then the respiration it is called commonly scientific some scientific terminology it is called, called inhalation and if it's some chemicals are uh, penetrated through derm, uh, skin root then it is called dermal root so they all and then there are other routes of entry into the system intravenous root it can be given intravenous means it is given directly into the vein intraperitoneal then intramuscular subcutaneous subcutaneous is, <laughs> Uh, through the skin, uh, the periphery of the skin. Then it comes into the liver, then kidneys and lungs. These are different organs and then it comes out of the system either through feces, urine and then uh, expired air one, that's air which you push out. Secretion, soft tissue and even they get and uh, absorbed in the bones. There are many toxic chemicals which after you get exposed, they go and get deposited in the bone also like lead. Lead is a highly toxic metal, and the, it, there is a, a increased exposure to lead. Part of the lead will go and get deposited into the bone. Even in case of arsenic, also it gets deposited into the bone. Certain amounts come out to the system in urine and through feces, but there are a good amount gets deposited into the bone. And once it gets deposited into the bone. It what happens even if you are not getting exposed to these toxic metals at a later stage after 20 years, 30 years, when you are in a very safe zone, even then that lead which has got deposited into the bone, it comes out of the system. If you are, suppose if you are having a deficiency of 
zinc, if you are having an iron deficiency, that lead comes out of the system and it becomes a future source of exposure. That's a very interesting statement. So there are certain terminologies which are being used and which commonly are called threshold limit values. Now, one terminology which is being used is called TLV, TWA. TWA, TLV is threshold limit value and time weight average, it, it is called time weight average. Now, this value is used for people who are working in an industry. So, and they calculate this value that a person should not exceed this particular value if he is working for eight hours, five days of a week. Any value like 50 TLV, there, there is a 50 milligram is the value for that, that environment in which the industrial worker is working. Then in that particular environment, the air quantity of that particular chemical should not exceed that particular limit. 50 should not, it should not increase the value 50. If for, if, suppose there, there is a chemical like called X and the value TW, TLV value is 50. So, but the question is that it should be, it is calculated on the basis of that person is working for eight hours for five days a week. And same is TLV, STEL. STEL is short term exposure limit. Suppose there is a value which has been given for a particular chemical, toxic chemicals, and the value is calculated for 15 minutes of exposure. So if a person is working in a particular environment, he should not get exposed for that particular chemicals in 15 minutes beyond that particular value which has been given. Like TLVC, ceiling limit, and the concentration should not ever exceed this value. So there are three terminologies which are being used in the industrial setup to describe and uh, that is what the uh, environmentalists, they go and calculate and they uh, analyze the various chemicals, various chemicals in the environment, soil, air, water, and these are the values for different chemicals uh, being prescribed. Now, just for example, TLV, TWA values, uh, these are just for the, your example, carbon monoxide, it should not exceed 40. What I mean to say that carbon monoxide value milligram per cubic meter for eight hours, it should not be more than this and person working for more five days a week. It should not exceed 40. Carbon dioxide, 9,000. Likewise, uh, sulfur dioxide, these are all the values which I have given. But you just come to the bottom, starting from mustard gas. You can see 0 0.003. What I mean to say that it should not have at all hydrogen cyanide. It should not have at all hydrogen cyanide in the environment or in the air because 0 0.003 is a minimal, it's a very minimal amount, 0 0.0001. These are not arbitrary values. These are all being calculated by the scientists and it has been prescribed that in a particular environment, in a particular air, the value of SOMAN should not be more than 0 0.00003. And this is all being calculated, uh, the formula which has been given in the bottom. Now, this is how we calculate the safety index. This is again an industrial terminology which will be used by the regulatory bodies. All chemicals may have some beneficial effects. So they call it safety index. And how it is being calculated? lethal dose 50, the dose which has been calculated for a particular chemical which can kill 50% of the population and effective dose 50 and the dose which can treat 50% of the thing and the ratio of this LD50 and AD50 is called safety index. Now I come to my topic that is weapon of mass destruction, the chemical warfare agents, the biological warfare agents, and the terminology by which perhaps you might have read in the newspapers, in the uh, television news, that politicians, when they discuss that there are, this is a weapon of mass destruction. What are these weapon of mass destruction? They are, they can be a nuclear agent, 
they can be a biological agent it can be a chemical agent so these are a technology which is currently being uh, discussed it is a fear and it is a threat in a global uh, in environment because these are the weapons which can be used by enemy countries against each other and they can be have a, dis a nuclear you all know that uh, these atomic bomb and these are all all called again a weapon of mass destruction biological warfare i have already said the viruses bacteria the vi these viruses can be used by a enemy country against as is a neighbors or terrorist in a very small quantity it is good enough to kill people and make or incapacitate the chem or chemicals i have already talked about but the problem is that this fear is more than the actual effect these chemicals biological chemicals chem or, bi or chemical agents they may not be so devastating they may not create so much of destruction death but the fear is more uh, people are so much scared that oh it can cause a lot of deaths it can do this much of damage it may but the most of that fear is uh, because it may have a secondary effects i'll just talk about these now this is what you call nato uh, with the, the, the description of a chemical warfare agent as described by nato a chemical substance which is intended for use in military operation to kill seriously injure or incapacitate people because of its physiological effects what is incapacitate you know what is how you can kill somebody or you seriously injured somebody but incapacitate means suppose you have a virus and you just uh, any terrorist or any uh, a person with a, a mind who's destructive mind can put that virus in a well and suppose or uh, it's it's in a gasic form and if gas is flowing on the direction towards where the army is there so it will make those army ill either they will have fever or they will have sneezing they will have so much so if they will have a, a what you call it fever they will not be able to fight so they have incapacitated the army so without killing anybody without injuring anybody they will make the army incapacitated they will not be able to fight they will become diseased they will become ill so for 15 days 10 days 15 days whatever may be the case this is how we, these chemical warfare are being used so in uh, in a very common way we, i can describe that mm -hmm. it is silent it is invisible you cannot see it pervasive and deadly something that may we may not hide from now just to give you some examples in world war 2 uh, these chemicals were used by germans against its enemies and you can see some pictures that how devastating effects it had on other you can see on the right side they had a, the army units had blisters wherever these gases were or wherever these bombs were thrown the people got exposed and they got blisters on their skin so these are some of the pictures i'll show again uh, now the strategy is, is covering an army against chemical warfare agents or biological warfare agents is expensive time consuming because the problem is that you don't know where is that chemical you can't see that suppose the enemy is using a gas sarin is a gas so if sarin has been used a bomb has been used on their own side they are suppose we are on this side and enemy is on the other side the gas is a gas bomb is being exploded on this side and suppose the air is flowing on the direction of uh, enemy side so what it will do wherever it, the gas will go it will have a, a devastating effects so it is very difficult to find it out so uh, how you can find it out whether a chemical warfare agents or biological warfare agent has been used by the enemy it's very difficult so it's expensive people are using sensors nowadays there are number of strategies being now, now being tried it's a time consuming hamper communication it's degrade fighting ability create panic chaos 
people will run people will go this way that way they don't know what you just remember what actually happened in uh, bhopal in the when the bhopal tragedy happened you know mic is another chemical which was uh, which came into the air and people start running into all directions it, the, the situation of panic was created number of deaths happened so these who knows that these mic uh, this uh, mic may can be used as a chemical warfare agent or it might have been used as a chemical warfare quick and urgent medical attention needed causes uncertainty and ultimate fever key fear so that's called ultimate terror weapon with massive footprints and is inexpensive easier manufacture affordable for developing nation and the terrorist army i'll just talk more about this massive footprint and expensive what actually is all about so this is a statement when this terrorist was caught in 1995 and he said these words we have the ability to make and use chemicals and poisonous gases and these agents and poison are made from simplest ingredient so the worst part is the most difficult thing is and the most alarming thing is that these gases or these mixtures can be prepared very easily you don't know you don't require a high fi science to make these chemicals so this is a very a, a distinct threat to us that we have to make a prepare to handle such type of situation because terrorists they can all make these type of chemicals very easily and this is for use against vital institution and residential population and drinking water sources so this is a very a, a, what you call it a very alarming situation now these are the classification of a chemical warfare agents there are four five type of chemical warfare one is called blistering agents and uh, sulfur mustard nitrogen mustard these are all chemicals nerve agents which are basically organophosphorus so but it's a very uh, high or amount um, of organophosphorus which are we called uh, nerve agents blood agents choking agents incapacitating already i have described what are choking uh, agent there are certain chemicals which are being used as a what you perhaps if you are there are some some science, science students are there they know about laughing agents laughing gas so even that can be used as a chemical warfare agent because what will happen uh, these chemicals will incapacitate the army they will not allow army to fight now i'll just go through the each or one of these uh, agents nerve agents as i said these are organophosphorus basically they are organophosphorus but they are of a different type of organophosphorus because there are in the last uh, the lecture also the, the person was talking about some organophosphorus which is normally called insecticide pesticide so they are all organophosphorus but they are not can be used as a organophosphorus uh, sorry as a chemical warfare agent because their action is are slow only when you get exposed to them for a high high amount of time then only it will have it but action is similar to pesticide or insecticide but their action is very rapid within minutes it will have uh, so it's a very uh, a different type of organophosphorus compound so it, they are very extremely toxic to humans and they are called chemical warfare agent and uh, this is what you call schedule y of chemical warfare convention uh, they have described it uh, is a as uh, a one of the barred chemicals they are not can be used no country can prepare these type of chemicals because they are deadly as you can see at the bottom i am again using the ld50 value to describe the how grave is the situation you know that all the audience to please mark these dichlorowas melathion they are all in pesticides so you can see the ld50 of these dichlorowas and melathion the ld50 is 300 to 6000 4000 but compared to these chemical warfare agent which are also chem organophosphorus but their ld50 is 25 so less is the amount more is the uh, toxicity 25 mg is required uh as a ld50 value the, to kill 50% of the population oil in the case of melathion is 40000 mg now these are called nerve agent this is how it impact your system i mean 
for the science science students, I think I'm using this particular slide. Uh, particularly, these are acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter which is which transmits the signals from one uh, from nerves nerve, nerve to other cells. Acetylcholine is the hydrolyzed by acetylcholine. I think I, I will skip this slide because it's a highly typical medical terminology. But you can see this particular slide because this is some one of the some of the experiments which we have carried out. You can see these are called muscarinic and nicotinic receptor stimulation. This is a normal rabbit eye. You can see before exposure, and once it gets exposed to serine, it got constricted. You can see that how that this particular you know you can see that retina how it has become a constricted retina. So what you call it, it's a tre it, it happens tremors also happens convulsions happen, and then ultimately that's due to respiratory paralysis. Now, blistering agents, why they are called blistering agents? Once you get exposed to these gases, particularly mostly they are all gases, sulfur mustard, nitrogen mustard, lewisite, these are all gases. Now, if you get exposed, your skin, if it gets exposed to such type of blistering agents, you will get blisters. Even if 0 0.001 microliters is good enough to form such type of blister in your so you at no cost you should get exposed to such type of chemicals now sulfur mustard effects are delayed now it doesn't kill only blisters are formed so once the blisters are formed it will lead to secondary infection and the secondary infection will become so lethal that after 15 days 20 days person will die because of blisters, secondary infection, which will be caused because of blisters rather than because of the chemical agents. So these are now <clears throat> you can see this is a very original photograph from taken from my own lab. Uh, a, one of my colleagues now he got exposed to uh, we were working on this because you require a very sophisticated lab to work. You have to take all precautions. You cannot get exposed to even if uh, one small drop, if you have left it on the bench, and I su suppose a person has come and got exposed, he will have blisters, such type of blister throughout his body. It's a very painful sight. You cannot even see those things. So very carefully we have to work. So this person also, uh, one bliss, uh, small drop got it dropped on his feet and he got this type of blisters. You can see that it's, it's a eating, lacrimation, blurred vision. And blurred vision is because of, I have already shown the slide uh, in the rabbit. And then uh, you get erythema and blisters, inflammation, there are a lot of swelling will be there, cough. These type of all the symptoms which will happen because of this. Another type of uh, this uh, blistering agent or a chemical warfare agent is arsenicals. There are two types of arsenic uh, things. One is inorganic arsenic and there is one organic arsenic. And among the organic arsenic, there is a gas which is called arsine. And the structure I have given on the bottom. So this arsenic gas was used in blood World War II by Germans against Britishers. And you can see this gas, arsine gas also causes same type of blisters as in case of sulfur mustard, which I have shown in the last slide. Same type of blister. But compared to sulfur mustard, this is comparatively less toxic, not that toxic as sulfur mustard. Sulfur mustard is a deadly toxic. But arsine also causes the same type of blisters. So these are some of the gases, uh, some arsenic-based chemical warfare agent, arsine, difluorocyclorhexene, lewisite. Lewisite is actually the gas which was used by the Britishers. Uh, oh, sorry, Germans against Britishers. And um, then uh, Britishers actually made a drug to fight British, this lewisite, and they called it British anti-lewisite. The name of the drug which was used to treat cases of lewisite was called British anti-lewisite, that is what you call BAL. Now you can see that these same type of blisters as you can see here, same type of after exposure to arsine gas. 
So why, how it ha functions? It uh, has a DNA. It damages your DNA alkylation happens. Then it binds with the glutathion. It is called glutathion. Can, uh, glutathion is nothing but it's a your what is self defensive mechanism. Uh, you require glutathione GSH, what you call in a, a very simple language. So you require more of glutathione in your body to fight any chemicals or any disease or any. So you require more of glutathione. But what happens, these arsenicals, these gases, these are toxic chemicals, they bind with glutathione. And once it binds with glutathione, the level of glutathione gets decreased. And once it decreases, your immune system gets decreased. And that is how you get disease. So this is how you, these blistering agents are uh, formed. Uh, it's a, the, you can see that there is a dermis and epidermis together and it, it, it separates the, the dermis because you can see that there are blisters, how they are being formed. The dermis becomes, and the dermis and epidermis, they get apart. And it and the, a fluid is filled with this type with, between the two, dermis and epidermis, the fluid is get filled and this is how the blisters are formed. You can see that this is again a very original photograph and uh, such type of problems happen. So you can see if you, a person, even if, it, if the person is not dying, he, it, he will become incapacitated. He will not be able to fight any battle. He will not, if suppose most of the army units, it gets such type of problems, then how it is going to fight? So this is a very, uh, one has to be prepared for uh, such type of eventuality and this is how our uh, entire DRDO labs they are making prepared for to fight such type of eventuality which is not has happened in the past but it is a distinct possibility that it may happen so we have to get prepared for such type of eventuality so these are blistering reactions as I have already said so no need to describe it again these are Lewisite it is called the dew of death and uh, this is a very common name which has been given by American chemical warfare agent. The due of death. This is a lewisite or what you call arsine gas. And it's, it's LD50. You can see that 30 milligram per kg is LD50 compared to sulfur mustard which has very less, almost like 5. So these are all the values. You can see that even small amount is very, very dangerous for the body. It may not lead immediately to the death, but it may have a very devastating effect. The short term exposure, suppose you have got exposed to only a very short period of time, it will lead to only weakness, fatigue, not very serious signs. So, but it will definitely have such type of, uh, you can see on the left side, headache, drowsiness, shortness of breath, such type of symptoms may happen if you have got exposed. Long term exposure may lead to kidney damage, numbness, memory loss, and diagnostic tests are these. These are the tests which are being carried out by the pathological lab to find it out whether you have got exposed to arsine gas, the chemical warfare in which you call it. Louis said, if you compare with mustard gas, uh, sulfur mustard, which I see, Louis said was seen as an alternative to sulfur mustard by virtue that it, effects are immediate. While in case of sulfur mustard, it takes hours to get uh, very serious symptoms, but in case of Lewisite, it, these effects are immediate. Higher volatility allows greater distant targets. It's because of high, highly volatile, so it can cover lump distance at a much, much bigger than uh, sulfur mustard. Effective over wider temperature range. What I mean to say, it can, even in the cold, it will have the same effect. It will, in the if there is a what you call hot climate is there, the effects are highly, very devastating. Much again, skin lesions are deeper with more necros necrotic. The skin, uh, in most of the uh, cases with mustard, it is mostly in the epidermis or dermis, but in this case, it, the effects are much, much deeper. And again, it's very easy to manufacture, offer storage stability, decomposition products are toxic. So these are better, I think, uh, what you call it arsine is much more effective in uh, compared to sulfur mustard. And second classification comes blood agents, hydrogen cyanide, potassium cyanides. These are all the cyanide agents, they are called blood agents. The effects are immediate. Again, it leads to weakness, giddiness, confusion, 
So these are all the symptoms of blood agents. Lung injury, that what you call it, where they cause injuries to the lungs. If you get exposed to such type of chemical warfare agent, the effects are choking agents, which are most of the most of the choking agents. They are called uh, lung chemical warfare agent. Phos gene is one. Diphos gene is another. And again, the effects are mostly on the respiratory effect. Respiratory means uh, your respiration system. These are toxins. Uh, toxins are those compounds which are formed from living organize, organism. It may be plants, it may be living organism. So anything like you can see the botulinum toxin, which I have already said, enterotoxin. They are all causing effects on the brain. These are all on the enotoxin, microtoxin. These are all what you call chemicals which are being produced from living organisms. Snake venom is another very good example of toxin. Now, what is required is detection. First of all, the chemical warfare agent should be how you can get prepared for face such type of problems, eventuality. You should be able to detect it quickly. So these are the three components on which we work. Detection, protection, and then decontamination. Decontamination is, if suppose, is one chemical warfare is it had been thrown by a enemy, we, how we can decontaminate? We, we can make it ineffective. So that is what we call it, decontamination. And then lastly, it comes the medical protection. So how to treat nerve agents? Termination of further intoxication is one person should be removed from the site of exposure immediately. And they should be given artificial respiration and that these are the drugs which are being given. Commonly, they are being given for any type of organophosphorus compounds like atropine, mostly oxymes, pantoride, obitoxin. These are all chemicals which are being given and dizepa. Now, you can ask me a very good question that suppose, sir, we are in a, uh, our army is fighting and uh, if they got exposed to such type of how they will be brought back to a hospital where they will be given such type of treatment. So to this is a huge question which DRDO was facing that if suppose in a situation like when a, our army unit has got exposed to such type of uh, toxic chemicals, so they require immediate treatment. So what they can do? So we uh, uh, at DRDO, we prepare these auto injector where it is, if, if suppose it's uh, what we did, there was a detection for the, for a detection, there was uh, like a litmus paper we prepared this that they used to keep it in their bag. So if they slight apprehension that there is a chemical which has been used by the enemy, they will inject the drug themselves. There are, you can see these are the all given given to our army units where they can inject these uh, pan chloride atropine themselves. And then uh, once they have got injected, they have got the protection, they can be brought back to the hospital where they can get better treatment. Even a uh, nasal spray has been given to the army units. So a lot of research is being done by our uh, DRDO on such type of facing such type of eventuality. So these are for the blistering agent that you have to wash the, your eyes, petroleum jelly, ciprofloxacin. These are all being given to the army, uh, our armed soldiers to first of all, get immediate relief from any such type of eventuality. And then they can be brought back to the hospitals and they can get a better treatment. Now, for our and antidote for arsenical warfare agent, so these are all emergency protection. Are these are all protective agents with which you are called M3 gloves. I don't want to go into such type of thing. For our talking about myself, I worked on this arsenic poisoning. I worked on getting a new antidote for treatment of arsenic, arsenicals, and arsenical gases also. And I worked for 15, 20 years on uh, finding a new treatment for uh, fire facing. As I said it, during my talk that uh, during World War II, lewisite was used by Germans against Britishers to, uh, as a chemical warfare agent. And they developed a drug which is called British anti lewisite And uh, this drug, what we found was it is a highly toxic uh, drug, very toxic drug. So beside giving relief to the patient, it is causing 
kidney damage also so these are some of the side effects which drawbacks adverse drug reaction which we detected so i thought that we should go for a new drug and i worked for 15 20 years on this particular drug and uh, this is what uh, just during my introduction i was told that this uh, drug we worked on this so once B, uh, british anti lewisite was found to be highly toxic americans developed a new drug that is called dmsa and this drug was found to be very very effective and uh, currently this drug is being used uh, for treatment of arsenic poisoning also, uh, which is a very common problem nowadays in India, particularly in uh, eastern part of India, West Bengal and uh, even uh, in Assam side, a lot of cases of arsenic poisoning, inorganic arsenic poisoning. I'm not talking about arsenic gas, which is a chemical warfare agent, but inorganic arsenic, which is there in the groundwater, uh, causing a lot of problems these days. And uh, as per the WHO recommendation, the, People say that in almost like 80 million people, they are already got exposed to arsenic. So this is the situation and the by problem, our problem, country's problem is that we do not have any drug to treat because most of the, these drugs, British anti-Lewisite is banned. DMSA is the American drug and it is not available, easily available in India and very costly drug. So we started working on uh, finding a new drug for the treatment of ars inorganic arsenic as well as for arsenic uh, warfare agent. Now, as you said, British anti is a oily liquid. DMSA was a water soluble powder. They are developed by USA as a drug. So from these two drugs, we, I prepared a new drug, which is a, called a monoisomyl DMSA. So almost like 15, 20 years of my research would led to uh, this drug, which was approved by our Drug Controller General of India, and now uh, trials, clinical trials. Clinical trials are those trials which are being conducted after permission from Drug Controller General in humans. And uh, what we have found so far, there are three stages of clinical trials which are conducted, phase one, phase two, and phase three. I have already completed phase one trials, and uh, phase two and phase three are still pending. So I hope this drug will be the first drug which will come into the market to treat cases of inorganic arsenic as well as arsenic as a chemical warfare agent or a arsenic as a gas. These are blood agents and uh, of course uh, for lung injuries, no specific treatment, artificial respiration is required. And for toxins, as I said, the natural toxin or what you call uh, the chemicals which are formed from living organism. As I said, ricin is one, and we use for detection, dot ELISA, ICT, brain. these are all the uh, detection method which were developed by us, and they are now been approved also by DRDO for any such type of, these are first aid kit which are being used. I will not go into all these type of details because these are all, now, I think almost, I have taken my own time. So these are all the threats and you can see these are the paper cuttings. Uh, these are not only a threat, but it has happened in the past because these are paper cuttings to, you can see on the left side in 2019, Iran accuses Israel of using chemical weapon in Gaza. That's, these are all coalition militants use white phosphorus. Even in the current war which is going on, it is being said that the other country is using uh, chemical warfare agents. So it's a Nobody has confirmed it, but there may be a possibility that such type of things are being. But the problem is, the biggest problem is that if even if these are being prepared, although there is a what you call Geneva Convention is there that most of the country there are 42 or 45 countries who are signed this that they will not synthesize, they will not prepare, they will not stockpile, they will not keep it as a weapon, they will not use it as a weapon against any country. These are all banned chemicals. They should not be used, but there are certain countries, uh, known countries which are being still being come, keeping it. They are not disclosing it. India is one of the country which has signed this United Nations con convention where they will not prepare it. They will not use it. But yes, we are have all the right to prepare ourselves, defend ourselves. So we are mostly working on to develop diagnosis protection 
medical countermeasures medical countermeasure means drugs we are preparing our drugs so that if even if there is a distinct possibility in near future if any uh, enemy country is using it against us we should treat we should be ready with our defense so but question is that such type of chemicals the countries which are who are prepared it where they will dispose it mostly what they are doing uh, america is one country which has they have thrown it it is alleged i i don't have any confirmation but they are alleged that they are throwing it into the sea so sea becomes environmentally polluted with this type of chemicals the toxic chemicals so these are all the threats which we have to bear and i think uh, some of the students who are listening to my talk perhaps they are also think of working on such areas the drdo is one organization where you can join as a researcher or as a scientist where you can work on in such direction where we our country should be ready to face and uh, i am mean, proud to sell tell that yes our country is all ready in case of any such eventuality it if happens but it's a distinct threat and most of us we are not aware of the whole purpose of my lecture was to make all you people aware as uh, this is what is expected in future it may happen it may and i always pray to almighty that it should never happen because say if, if, if it will happen it will have a very devastating effects so but i only pray but we should always be ready to face like what happened in corona i mean we were found wanting but but still our country was ready with uh, vaccine it and uh, it got for bit that after sec second wave we were ready with the third uh, we were able to fight the third wave so the reason is that we should be ready with any such type of eventuality which may happen thank you very much and i think i have, might have taken little more time than uh, was so the conclusion is the safety evolution of drugs and chemicals is required to understand the side effects and toxic effects awareness and preparedness are required to reduce the toxic threat of hazardous chemicals so they are very hazardous chemicals they are very dangerous chemicals and uh, we but only thing we cannot stop enemy countries or terrorist or any uh, bad elements to use it against us but we can always be ready to fight any such eventuality thank you very much and uh, thanks uh, mamta also for giving me this opportunity Uh, thank you, Dr. Flora. And the success of your lecture is that that uh, the chat is filled with uh, with the messages for you. That the lecture was very informative. It was amazing. It was wonderful. It was really treat hearing you. So on the behalf well, of everyone okay. present here, yeah, yes, sir. Please go ahead. It's fine. I mean, I'm thank you very much. Uh, my purpose because I was little uh, reluctant to give too much of scientific. Um, a medical terminology but i thought that should make this lecture very simple uh, and uh, so that even a student from other disciplines can understand so i hope if i have been successful in conveying the message which was more important so thanks thank you very much thank you so you were very successful in doing that and every word could make out what we are talking about even he was from arts or a science or something it was very self explanatory lecture on the behalf of uh, everyone present here i would like to express our gratitude to you for the talk on medical protection against chemical warfare resin you quoted that Thank what you. happens if the laughing gas is released in the army area and whole army starts laughing this is so dangerous you so rightly yes. said that it is the dose which decides the substance to be toxic or non toxic it reminds me of a yes. quote um, since you are a toxicologist and me too paracelsus paracelsus says that everything is a poison is the dose yes. which decides the poison and the remedy yes 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 yes, yes. it was so true and you spoke about like lead toxicity which is so dangerous and quite common in indian households talking about yes. ld50 and ed50 such a in such a wonderful way that you even making layman understand it your yes. talk was not only ex extremely informative but also kept everyone entertained in their seats including me the size of participation you. during our talk is a testimony that how thrilled everyone is to listen to you when you are speaking we sincerely Thank appreciate you. you for taking out time from a busy schedule and provide us with such a valuable information all thanks for your support i wish you great luck with all your future Thank projects you. and look forward to meeting you soon
since you sure. also have a personal connection with Alwar, I really hope that you would be joining <laughs> us in our offline conference. I see I will. DC 22, which is scheduled to be held from 11th to 13th, August 2022. Sir, I will request you to please block the dates. <laughs> I will. I will. Please block Certainly, the dates. Because my bro yeah. and the I have been to Alwar many times uh, because my brother lives there. So I, I remember. hope I will be sure. So yeah, he's in Alwar. And, yeah. and we, we are guests. Sure. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you, and take care, Dr. Flora. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Now, thanks. Now it's time for our fourth and the last keynote address for today, which will be delivered by Dr. Prem Adhish Lekhi, member of to talk to us COVID-19 Task Force Malaysia. Dr. Prem Adhish Lekhi is currently working as a medical medical doctor as SSIUM INGO in Ipoh, Perak, Malaysia. He is also a member of Doc to Us COVID-19 Task Force Malaysia. He has been recipient of many awards like Asian Youth Leadership Award, Vishish Chikitsak Award for Medical Profession and Community Service, Outstanding Award for Social Change, Jury Member International Model Citizens Assembly, Climate Change, Commonwealth Innovation Forum 2021 Award, Member Spotlight International Society of Quality of Life Studies USA, Plenary Speaker, Research Foundation of India, Special Guest Speaker, Universal Model United Nations, The Man Medal, CWCSIR, Charles Walter Society of Innovation and Research, and many more. So we are very happy to have you with us, Dr. Lekhi, and I would request you to start with your lecture. Dr. Prem Adhish Lekhi, so the stage is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Dr. Adhish. Okay, let me begin. Uh, yes, sir. I am not sure if the camera is allowed here. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for all the organizers. I want to personally thank Professor Dr. Hukam Singh, uh, Dr. Mamta Sharma, Dr. Karpana Soni, Ms. Muskan, the organizers. I have been listening very patiently to all the first day keynote speakers. Since I am the last, and I have been sitting on the other side also in my lifetime. Yes. So I know there is a little bit of this sister, probably it is 2.30 now in India. Uh, the reason I am saying this, the flow chart is so beautifully made. You started with the patron speech, and then you went on to the environmental sciences, to the ancient science of Sanskrit, to the pharmaceutical, and now to the uh, medical doctor, I really want to salute the person who made this flow chart. I mean, Thanks. someone with very <laughs> exceptional brain will do such kind of work. Thanks so, so much. Congratulations. Uh, one observation I made. Okay, now coming back to the quotes, uh, I sent you um, some form of PDF or PPT. Uh, can you do the screen sharing there? Yes, Dr. Lakey, we are starting. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. First, I want to thank the previous speaker who laid out a very beautiful foundation for my talk because it is very difficult to hold an audience in the Department of Zoology with medical jargon. And from pharmaceutical to medical background, now it is a bit easy for me to move on. It did touch upon something which I am going to uh, touch upon very extensively, and that was the current war, which we hesitantly do not mention for various reasons. Okay, now being a teacher, let me start with the syllabus. Uh, that will be the next slide. Thank you. The environmental risk assessment of the solid and hazardous waste management rules, the hazardous waste control and remediation, the evaluation of toxicity and the toxic materials, their physiological and metabolic effects. Now, the whole conference is basically an international short-term training a program series. I hear want to highlight something which you have done very brilliant. The front page with the two lines. 
we don't own the planet Earth. We belong to it and we must share it with our wildlife. Wonderful, how beautiful. Uh, we think animals are not important. One well, of the department of zoology was not like this, but I think they are very important. I became a vegan knowing that I do not want to hurt animals. And then, your most beautiful slogan, I love this, be kind to mother nature. Uh, so from there, I was so impressed with the whole organization committee that how beautifully you have been setting up this. Now coming back to this environmental toxicology. Now let's go to the definition. Now it is a multidisciplinary field of science concerned with the study of harmful effects of various chemical, biological, and physical agents on the living organisms. You know this A IAEA in Vienna, the International Atomic Energy Agency, they monitor the pollutants, the plutonium and the uranium in the nuclear reactors. Now, I'm going to talk of some very heavy stuff here. Uh, hopefully, all are awake enough. Because this Ukraine war cannot be taken non-seriously anymore. The environmental toxicology is now on the rise. Just look at the air level pollutants, the air index, the air quality as we call it, over Ukraine and you will be shocked. This war may, as the rumor says, have already begun from the chemical and biological warfare point of view. We will not go into the politics of this, though we all know it very well, because my real interest and passion goes back maybe 50 years in the Vietnam War when orange agent was sprayed over the forests of Vietnam by none other than our dear US. Now, at this moment, there's another country which we call a billion, and those days there was another country. So the superpowers have their way of getting their things done. And being a medical advisor there, I started to take deep interest in this subject. And the reason I'm saying this, many of them, uh, of the students here who may have not even been born by that time, is the agent orange, which had many other colors, many other codes, the white, the blue, the white, uh, the purple, and so many because of the drums they were stored in, and some may have not even much interest in this subject, but I want to bring this into the notice because of the current situation in the world. We are now on the edge of a World War III. I may not want to mention this, but it is time to start thinking about this because the previous uh, professor, the doctor, the ex-director, has done some marvelous work in this, and already he has given hints to Indians, to the world, to the army, that this could be the next scenario. And are we ready? Because I'm in the COVID-19 task force, so I am telling you, everyone was shocked when COVID-19 came. The whole world was not ready. And now everyone is shocked again, because no one is ready for a biological or a chemical warfare. So that is why I think this conference is very important, and these subjects are not to be taken with just a cup of tea, as I said. Now, my journey has a relationship with Rajasthan, because you are sitting there, because I did my test in Jaipur, and then from India, I went to Vietnam. In a Singapore NGO, joined a German NGO with a Swiss and Spain bursary, I got so much interested in the three hospitals there, in Ho Chi Minh, Hanoi, and Haiphong, and where this Agent Orange became such a big thing and nobody was talking about it anymore till now, 2022, when again, there is a possibility of such things happening. Okay, uh, shall we go further? Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the whole credit of this talk, of course, I am just a speaker. 
goes to this, I call her my mother. Rachel Carson is considered the mother of environmental toxicology, and she made it a distinct field within toxicology in 1962 with the publication of her book, Silent Spring. Anybody interested, please go and read this. Amazon will have it, which covered the effects of uncontrolled pesticides. Yes, so mild, we all use it, herbicides, pesticides, but this is where things went wrong. Rachel Louise Carson from say, 1964, she left the world, was an American marine biologist and environmentalist whose book, Silent Spring and other writings are credited with advancing the global environmental movement. So it all started with one woman's great effort since we just celebrated the uh, Women's Day. Uh, so I want to really congratulate all the women here, uh, especially uh, Dr. Mamta, with whom I had a very good communication for this conference. Um, okay, ne next slide, please. Thank you. Silent Spring Rachel Carson, so she is this lovely lady. I really salute her for what she has done. Uh, next, please. Okay, something about her now. Late in the 1950s, Carson turned her attention to conservation, especially environmental problems that she believed were caused by synthetic pesticides. The result was Silent Spring. That's how the book came out in 1962. Many of you, the students, may not even be there, which brought environmental concerns to an unprecedented share of the American people. Okay, although Silent Spring was met with fierce opposition, it always will. Whenever you want to do something good, you will be opposed, remember this, by chemical companies. You know, Monsanto, a very, uh, I call it a giant company in US, uh, they were instrumental for this Agent Orange. Uh, a spur, uh, spurred a reversal in national pesticide policy, which led to a ban on DDT. Well, I am from Punjab, so, well, who doesn't know what is DDT um, and other pesticides and inspired a grassroots environmental movement that led to the creation of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. You know, everything starts from there and then it goes around the world. So Carson was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Jimmy Carter of the USA. Imagine she was recognized only after she left the world. I mean, that's, I call it the strength, the power of her life. Uh, next, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, there's maybe another photograph there. Okay, now let's come to the real picture. Uh, next, please. So, Agent Orange in Vietnam War, this started in about 61, 62. So, this is what? This is an herbicide. This is an exfoliate. This is sprayed by these aeroplanes over the uh, forest. Now, as the previous speaker spoke very beautifully about how the enemies, they use it. So this is also to get uh, the gorilla warfare, as they call it, the gorillas out of the jungles, right? And then the effects on their health. Um, now this, we are talking about environmental toxicology of the highest, uh, I call it the negative way. Uh, but who got really affected? The people of Vietnam, the North and South were having a war, but also the war veterans of USA. Remember this. So as we call it, the good and bad guys both will get it. So which is good, which is bad, we have to decide later. Uh, next, please. Thank you. Agent Orange in this Vietnam War, uh, something to really ponder upon. Uh, the, during the Vietnam War between 62 and 71, look how long it lasted. And again, America as usual, you know, uh, the billion, I call it. The military sprayed about uh, 20 million gallons. Well, that is all figures. I do not know how much is that. Uh, the herbicides and the defoliants in Vietnam, the goal was to defoliate the rural forested land, depriving the gorillas of food and cover and clearing the sensitive areas such as around the base perimeters. The program was also part of a general policy of the forced drive uh, urbanization ultimately destroyed the ability of the peasants to support themselves in the countryside, forcing them to flee to the U.S. dominant cities, depriving the gorillas of their rural bases, as we call it. Well, that is part of the war. Uh, now here, for people who may be interested in biochemistry, biochemistry, though it's the Department of Zoology, I'm very much aware, uh, Agent Orange, many people would like to ask, is unpurified butyl 
esters, uh, uh, 2,4-D, they call it dichlorophenyl acetic acid, and 2,4-5-T. Uh, uh, of course, this is medical jargon, but you can just digest it. Trichlorophenoxy acetic acid. So uh, the latest reports which I had in my notes was that about 50 million liters of this and 170 kilos of dioxin. The previous uh, speaker talked a lot about this dioxin. So thank you, sir, for making my <laughs> speech a little bit easier. Uh, so all this is definitely poison. Uh, next, please. Thank you. Now, what kind of pictures are you seeing? There's something called thalidomide effect where the child does not have limbs, neither the hands nor the feet. You look at the effects. Um, I call it terrible. And the diseases that followed, uh, diseases, uh, uh, I saw only three hospitals there with the myelodosis, as we call it, you just have to just listen, leukemia and chloroacne, or severe form of acne, as we call it. Uh, even diabetes type 2, can you believe? Hodgkin's disease and the ischemic heart disease, heart disease, multiple myeloma, and the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, all types of cancers, Parkinson's disease and the peripheral neuropathy and the prostate cancer, respiratory cancer, and the soft tissue sarcomas. Uh, next, please. Thank you. Now, effects on the Vietnamese people, the health effects. The Vietnam Red Cross reported as many as 8 million Vietnamese people have been affected by the Agent Orange, including at least about 150,000 children born with birth defects. Imagine, just imagine. Now, according to the Vietnamese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the 4.5, actually about 5 million Vietnamese people were exposed to this Agent Orange, they, they name it. Because this was stored in a drum which was labeled orange. It's so simple to understand. They will do all these tricks. Uh, resulting in uh, 400,000 people being killed or maimed and about 500,000 children born with birth defects. Um, so sad. Okay, next please. Some photographs. Yes, we do not like to see, but we have to face the hard facts of life, of terrible wars that is like now taking place. It's already one month, yes. They have been only having the worst case scenario of supersonic missile, as we all know from the TV. But imagine when such things are going to happen again, will it not be a shame what have we learned from World War I or World War II? Nothing, if we still have another war. Yes, I sound uh, not very friendly, but then somebody has to speak up. Uh, next, please. Environmental uh, toxicology now is a multidisciplinary field, right? As we have mentioned, now, it has the harmful effects of various of these agents, you know, this chemical, biological, and, uh, and the physical. And uh, honestly, uh, these are terrible effects on animals, on plants, on human, on life in general. Also, microorganisms. Now, you see the toxicology effects, or we call it the toxicokinetics, uh, if we see just the one of the tables, the toxicodynamics, the response and the risk assessment. I may not want to go into other more things, much more technical, but what I'm trying to say here is that uh, if nobody understands anything today from me, at least you understand the war, and then you can understand what can happen next. So this is the picture of what can happen next. Uh, next, please. The uh, harmful effects of these chemical and biological agents can include the toxins from the pollutants, the insecticides, the pesticides, and the fertilizers, all of which can impact the organisms and its community, all those shifts in the species diversity and a lot of abundance. Resulting changes in the population dynamics impact the ecosystem by during altering its uh, productivity and the stability. I have a lot of photographs. Uh, next, please. So you just uh, sit down and relax and enjoy. Uh, though it's a subject of a great, uh, I call it severity and ignorance. Uh, either we do not like to see such pictures or talk about such things till they happen. Uh, okay, next, please. Environmental toxicology. Now, there are many sources of this uh, toxicity that can lead to the presence of the toxins. And, you know, mainly things affected are the three very close to us our food, our water, and our air. We cannot live without them. Uh, though we all day and night run after money, I, I sometimes laugh that 
take these three things out of the world and let me see what your money can do. And look, people with money are fighting now. These sources include the organic and the inorganic pollutants, the pesticides and the biological agents, all of which can have harmful effects on the living organisms. Okay, now I will go for to a satire now. Next, please. I love to draw. Uh, now, you see this rat is asking this person now, imagine if I am standing there, do you also eat this with the, that mask on? And by the way, we are having a mask on COVID-19. So imagine the quality of life we people are having since then. And we think we have progressed, we have educated, we have money and we can do what we like. No, sorry, you can't try this. So it's a rat asking humans, if you are putting it on me, you are also putting it on your food. Can you eat then? Look at the question back. I mean, an animal may not want to ask. So here the battle is all, you'll be very happy that the animal is the winner here. That man thinks man is very smart, man is not smart. So the next one is the caution, the pesticide spraying, bring progress, uh, proceed at your own risk. So imagine we are trying to save ourselves, but actually we are not protecting ourselves. We try to protect the plant and we try to protect ourselves, but the truth is we are damaging both. Uh, next, please. So the PCB, uh, as in short it's called, the pollutant, uh, why go into that uh, uh, chemical name may not uh, be so interesting to anyone. Uh, okay, these are banned in, uh, you know, all these uh, progressive Western countries, the uh, United States and Canada. But, honestly speaking, uh, in the third world, in Asia, uh, you still find them. And uh, uh, the greatest trust to the knowledge students here, the persistent nature of these species in the aquatic ecosystems and the many aquatic species contain high levels of this uh, chemical. So people eating fish, salmon, you may have this bad news that the PCD level is very high. Uh, well, one reason I became a vegetarian is after studying the bad effects of what can go wrong. But then this is very individual. Um, next, please. Thank you. Now the look at uh, what other things we use, the electrical installations and the paints and the plaster and the building residues and the PCB in the soil and the PCB from the precipitation and uh, what what uh, is being trying to be uh, like to be shown here is basically look we are living around poison and poison is around us and the poison is getting inside us as uh, the previous speaker really pointed out very beautifully um, thank you sir um, okay next please now this will be the favorite <laughs> slide for all zoology students, if you are still there. Though I found about 100 students actually leaving because I am a teacher and a very strict teacher, so I observe everything, even from 10,000 kilometers. Now you just see, okay, let's not go into the PPMs, uh, though the, uh, they will have um, how much has gone into how much, like uh, if you start from the small river there and then the seawater, and then you see the 0 0.000002, okay, that's all micro. Uh, going to the sediment, going to the plant plankton, if you have a phytoplankton, they call it, then to the animal plankton, the zoo plankton, as they call it, going into the vertebrates, and then to the fishes, and the seabirds, and the marine mammals. And the strength increases. So, in other words, the PCBs go on increasing. So, what has the poor animal to do with you and your stupidity? As I call it, it is because of man's folly, animals suffer. So this I consider one of my favorite conferences uh, because we are creating problems for the animals. The animals are not creating problems for us. Let's face them. Uh, thank you very much. Next, please. Okay, heavy metals. I'm sure you have friends and you may have uh, eaten something wrong, food poisoning, and then some doctor may have also said, this is food poisoning. But you know what is food poisoning actually? Oh, we had something wrong. But what is that wrong thing? Nobody goes so much deep into that. So the heavy metals found in the food sources, such as the fish, can also have you harmful effects. These metals, now the, focus on this. Mercury, lead, aluminium, uh, cadmium, all these are I tell you, very, very, very toxic. It has been shown that fish are exposed to higher cadmium levels and grow at a slower rate than fish exposed to lower levels. 
so imagine uh, the damage that uh, mankind is doing even below sea level <laughs> in the oceans the poor fish has to suffer because of us their, their growth is stunted because of our greed i call it uh, next please heavy metals uh, now look lead and this uh, copper mercury and arsenic and uh, cadmium arsenic as the previous doctor also was telling us is simply out of this world just don't try to even go near that uh, so imagine now since uh, being on the uh, human side let's talk about the effects the memory loss the allergies and the weight gain and the digestion problems and skin rashes and cold feet and balance problems and immune dysfunction joint stiffness fatigue high blood pressure and heart problems irritability mental confusion and so on and so forth and the list never ends so this is just for purpose of uh, making people understand especially the zoology that this is the same effect the animal is going to face it not much we may have more as i call it um, uh, evolution right homo sapiens came from where right the apes as we call it so what is there to laugh so it is just because we became a little bit more refined doesn't make us more intelligent though our iq is higher than an animal right we can smile right and then uh, have you seen animals smiling or we can think and we can act but what are we doing are we smiling is the war an answer to a smile or are they not hating each other let's put it this way bold and frank so this means humans after all these years of evolution is still the same an animal okay sorry to say that uh, i am strong in all this thank you uh, next please environmental toxicology pesticides are major source of the environmental toxicity i'm going to say this again pesticides are a major source of environmental toxicity and we have agriculture we have farming we have farmers so how the word organic came it all came because of this so these chemically synthesized agents have been known to persist in the environment long after their administration uh the poor bio uh, as we call it um, degradability degradability of the pesticides can result in the bio accumulation of chemicals in various organisms along with the bio magnification within a food web now the pesticides can be categorized according to the pest they target now the insecticides are used to eliminate the agricultural pests that attack the various fruits and crops but you also pay the price just go in the evening and buy all those fruits and vegetables and then ask me was i wrong so the herbicides target the herbal pests such as the weeds and other unwanted plants that reduce the crop production so that's how ddt came into this world right well somebody was hurting my farms my agricultural fields so i need a medicine so this became a medicine but it became a poison okay and this i will prove in the next slide uh, next please so you are rich and now you are in canada and you have this aeroplane and so you can spray all the pesticides and so when they took a microscope with the poor tomato was there and then they say oh my goodness the tomato looks very fine but no it is not fine so they caught uh next please so the pesticide the everyday life of cotton farmer and the pesticide cloud so we only think that ah oh, he's doing a good job but you don't see the pesticide cloud that you are inhaling and that's where the damage is going to start uh okay next please so insecticides now the ddt okay the if maybe somebody wants to know the name dichloro diethyl trichloroethane well, is a chemical name is an organo chlorine insecticide that has been banned due to its adverse adverse effects on both humans and wildlife in the 60s you know it came i think dt was widely used by the farmers in order to kill the agricultural pests so in 1962 the harmful effects of this widespread and uncontrolled use of ddt so this was how rachel carson's book silent spring came up so if this book never came out the world would have never even known what was going on and what was actually going wrong So such large quantities of DDT and its metabolites and other DDT, you, you call it the brother or sister of this, that were released into the environment were toxic to both the animals and humans. So the plants, the animals, the humans, all were being actually harmed without even being known. Till I call the great lady came out with the book and said, "Hello, all of us are wrong." Okay, thank you. Next, please. And she proved it. 
Look at this man. See what he is doing. And okay, I kill a mosquito. Oh my God, I kill a flea, a fly, whatever. And imagine, and I think I've done a great job. No, you have also inhaled the poison. So have your son. So have your pet. So this is just a metaphor. This is just a way of uh, diagrammatically representing a cartoon to show that all of us live on the same planet. We do not have a planet B and we are damaging one also thinking we are saving ourselves. No, we are not saving ourselves. Everybody is being harmed. Uh, next, please. Thank you. Now, DDT is not uh, easily biodegradable and thus the chemical accumulates in the soil and sediment runoff, right? The water systems become polluted. Imagine, it's not the soil, it's the water. The marine life, such as fish and the shellfish, we know so much shellfish poisoning, especially I see around this Southeast Asia you now, accumulate DDT in their tissues. Furthermore, this effect is amplified when the animals who consume the fish also consume the chemicals, demonstrating biomagnification within the food web. So important, you know, the animals can, leading to biomagnification within the food web. So the process of this uh, biomagnification has detrimental effects on the various bird species. Um, rapid declines in bird populations have been seen in uh, various parts of the world. I was listening to the, I think, the first speaker, right? And he gave a very good uh, account of his uh, uh, work in America, I think. And he was talking about this. So I want to thank him for that. Thank you, sir. So this is how I keep abreast. Because as you know, lifelong learning means you are only a good teacher if you are a good student. And you have to be a good student all your life because you cannot be a teacher all your life, but you can be a student all your life. So do not be ashamed to be a student. Okay, having said that, next please. Environmental toxicology. Well, this is again the uh, photographs of the situation over there. Um, okay, uh, next one, please. Okay, this is how this labels were starting. Uh, next slide, please. The environmental risk assessment, right, this is where actually the crux of the problem is. The solid and the hazardous waste uh, management rules. Many people do not know anything about this. Honestly, I, I really learned it while doing my own research that uh, we know very little about it and waste is just not our favorite subject. So the hazardous waste are considered highly toxic and therefore disposable of uh, such waste needs proper attention so as to reduce the possible environmental hazards. So the disposable is very important, right? So the industrial growth now, why we are so proud of 2022? Because when we go to another country, we see, oh, that country has done so well. And uh, because of the industrial revolution, the growth, so which has resulted in generation of huge volume of hazardous waste in that country, we do not notice that. We just notice the beautiful buildings, we eat the food, and we take some photographs, and we think we have made our day. Sorry. In addition to this uh, hazardous waste, sometimes get imported mainly from the Western countries for reprocessing or recycling. I will show you some maps that will really shock you uh, what is actually happening in the world. Uh, the inventorization of hazardous waste Generating units in the country is not yet even completed. Imagine this is a very powerful statement. The scientific disposal of uh, hazardous waste has become a major environmental issue in India. Actually, it's global. But uh, may I just uh, put the torch in India for a moment. Uh, next slide, please. Next, please. Thank you. OK, this I'm sure many have seen, right? in your life and uh, we have not even given a single second thought what is this what does it mean dangerous or flammable or oxidizer or corrosive or radioactive just imagine now 2022 there is a war going on in some part of the world and that could get even serious and just it has to cross the borders and things then these things are going to become very common so that is my warning to the fighting factions of the people who are now listening that how bad things can be if our decisions are really bad. Okay, now we let's come to uh, some very beautiful things India have done. Uh, I'm very proud of that. And uh, I want to highlight that. Uh, please, next slide, please. The environmental risk assessment, solid and hazardous waste management rules 
uh, this was framed 1989, the central government amended in 2000, 2003. You know, nothing can happen after 2004, you'll be surprised to deal with the hazardous waste related to the environmental problems that may arise in the near future. They know we're going to have a problem, but actually we're still not ready. Okay, next one. This will shock you a bit. Uh, if you have heard of Fukushima nuclear reactor during the uh, earthquake and the tsunami in Japan, because I was there uh, in Sendai, and uh, the nuclear uh, uh, fallout in the water is damaging, is going over the Pacific. We have seen uh, they've done tests in America and they have found traces. So this is some news, I'm sure you have read it in papers, seen on TV, and probably ignored it thinking, well, it's not my problem. The problem is ours, frankly speaking. Um, okay, next one. Probably this may relate to all of us in some way. The next slide, please. This chain, uh, am I going fast? Next slide, please. need to use your camera because I can't. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the environmental risk assessment, solid and hazardous waste management rules, the uh, transfer station. Uh, you see, there are five rooms here. Uh, they're doing the fuel blending here. Then they're doing this uh, treatment. And then they go to the incineration and then the hazardous landfill. We will come to the landfill. The, there are a lot of landfills in most countries and the recycling uh, process. So this is a very beautiful uh, chain as to how uh, things are done. Let's put it this way. Uh, okay, let's crudely speak about this. Uh, next slide, please. Wonderful. Okay, now the environmental management of hazardous waste has become a major concern in India as haphazard dumping of hazardous waste results in severe environmental impairment. You must have noticed in these uh, industries, you know, the backwaters, uh, back rivers, why go far? You just have to go to Taj Mahal and the backs, back of this and the river and what is happening there and what kind of dumping is taking place. Now, this, has, this is news coming out of India to other countries. Um, uh, well, I do not like to hear anything bad about uh, India because I'm an Indian, um, but we have to face the facts. And not India is a culprit, the whole world is culprit because everybody is trying to escape the adverse effects of other ways as well as the significant potential risks posed by them to the life and its supporting systems are increasingly recognized. Rapid growth of industries in India has resulted in generation of increasing volume of other ways, both indigenously uh, generated and imported from other countries for recycling or reprocessing need scientific treatment and disposable and disposal. Uh, well, if I tell you that America is sending something to you which is actually not uh, welcomed by you and it's not actually needed by you, will you agree? No, this is how it's going to happen. However, only a few secured landfill sites are available in the country for disposable of uh, that is based in an environmentally sound manner. So where will the rest go? And that's where the trouble begins. Not in India. This trouble is all over the world. Okay, next please. This will give you some idea as to what happens. Okay, I paint my house. I just throw, I dump in somewhere. Or I do some cleaning or whatever. But I do not uh, think much about the corrosives, the pollutants, the poisons, the hazardous waste material because there are no management rules and nobody is going to catch me. Okay, next please. The Thank you. Now, here's where I am very proud of India. The an illegal dumping of the hazardous waste by the industries may cause severe environmental pollution, the Ministry of the Environment and Forest. You know, they have an environment and a forest together. Uh, usually yesterday, probably yesterday, the first month was the, what they call, the, they celebrate this day of the forests uh, because a lot of deforestation is taking place. 
has promulgated the hazardous uh, waste management and handling rules in 1989 and amended the same in 2000 and 2003. Good, at least they amended uh, for proper uh, management and handling of the hazardous waste in the country. Uh, I may be just reading it, but it is worth. These rules also deal with the ban for importing a few categories of hazardous waste because they are coming to India. You will not even be knowing this. People are making India like a dustbin. Sad, shameful, I call it. And not that. The rich countries are doing it with every poor country, or the so-called poor country, or the middle-income countries. Now, India has also ratified the Basel Convention. This was in Switzerland on transboundary movement of the hazardous waste in 1992, which is a significant tool for controlling and monitoring of import and export of hazardous waste and its proper uh, management. Uh, this is important, this Basel Convention. Anybody who is interested, maybe even one person today, that you made my day. Uh, that this Basel Convention that took place actually changed the way the world thinks about waste. Um, next, please. Next slide, I want you to keep it for some time and just look at it. Just look at it and just let it sink into your soul. And ask yourself, have you ever done this? Have you ever seen this? Have you ever seen others doing it? This is being done, not in India alone. This is being done, I consider, in all the 200 countries in the world. And openly. And that, my dear friends, brothers and sisters, is environmental toxicity at its height. There's nothing worse than this. And it is going on. Secret pictures. Okay, next please. The characteristics of the hazardous waste, the, which may be in solid, liquid, or gaseous form. Well, the previous speaker, I really want to salute him. Uh, he brought this subject very beautifully. May cause the danger to health or the environment either alone or when in contact with other waste. Hazardous waste can be identified by the characteristics of uh, that they exhibit this. Look at these four words. Just concentrate on them. Ignitability can cause fire. Corrosivity leads to corrosion. Reactivity just has to get another anything, chemical, and it will react. Or toxicity. Poisonous. I call the word deleterious. Very damaging. The characteristics of this hazardous waste. Now see the poison, the corrosive, the toxic, the oxidizing agent. And you name it. I mean, this is no end of it. Uh, there may be just boards. And you find when you go travel, especially to all these places, uh, they are boards just to save you. And to tell you that all is not fine. So do not step in. Uh, so everyone must learn them and must be uh, very, uh, what I call, aware of such. And if you are doing such business or if you are around such, you should also have your uh, labels and your play cards and uh, all your boards uh, ready so that you save yourself and you save others. Okay, the next one is very important. The characteristics of the hazardous waste. Okay, now here is something very important, uh, like the flammable explosive. Uh, which can cause the damage to the surroundings uh, at high uh, temperature and, and pressure. What is this war? It is flammable, explosive. What is happening around you and me? We may be miles away from each other. We may all see the same movies, the same TV, the same programs, the same war. And this is happening. And so the air quality now and that part of the world is finished. We have seen six, seven, this goes above 10. So oxidizing types of the waste that may yield the oxygen, thereby cause or contribute to the combustion, uh, combustible oxidizing agents, poisonous acute. Uh, they have high potential to cause death, serious injury or harm health, swallowed, inhaled, or skin contact. When I was an intern, I want to tell you this, I had all these uh, cases where these love stories failed and so they were Drink poison, simple, and then come to the emergency. And then they ask the doctor, solve my problem. I say, you should have asked me before drinking this, but now. So, okay, this is just an anecdote. Just to change the scene, you may be not 
<laughs> so happy with the whole uh, topic that I'm tackling with, with great enthusiasm. Uh, the reason is it has become pastime getting ourselves poisoned. Okay, now we have other reasons to get poisoned. You can even flit your mosquito in the evening because there are a lot of mosquitoes. I have been to mosquito infested areas and tell me I kill the mosquito but I also harm myself. Believe me. So the corrosives and the, uh, you know, this Deepavali, we are Hindus and Indians and we celebrate and then you know what happens the next day and they call it uh, Delhi, the most polluted uh, city in the world. I do not know. Well, that's, that's a distinction nobody wants. I think Beijing is. But uh, I find uh, all other festivals and where crackers are used, uh, they cause the same problems. And that's one reason the government bans and then the companies do, are not happy and the people are not happy. And so this uh, tug of war will go on. But I think with every year more awareness is coming in. And so we are uh, polluting our air less and less and uh, having more awareness of these uh, hazardous weights and trying to understand that the, the meaning of festival is not uh, wearing nice clothes and eating sweets and uh, what you call burning crackers but loving each other, accepting each other the way we are. That is probably missing, and that's why we are having wars. So the, yes, I do give all this. <laughs> I call them my slokas in between uh, as a social uh, motivator. Organic uh, peroxides, uh, they are those weights uh, that undergo the exothermic self, uh, well, decomposition, let's put it this way. Okay, next please. Here comes my lovely India. So the process waste, you know, the characteristics, the hazardous waste in India can be categorized broadly to the uh, the waste that is generated in India from various industries. But what you do not know is they are also exported to India. Uh, and uh, yes, we also are culprits. Uh, we do import and export, and so it is wrong. But it is happening, and there is a lot of. Uh, things behind this, as we all know, there's always a mafia behind everything, not only Bollywood, but everything. Sorry to say the word Bollywood, you will not like it. But let's face it, it is time for the bold to speak out. If you do not, this environmental toxicity is not going to go away. And there is a lot of toxicity in humans as well. So we have to rid ourselves of our way of life, our lifestyle, our thinking, and only then things are going to improve. Okay, the next uh, slide will really make Rajasthan very happy because for the first time you may not be in the top 10 and you do not want to be the top 10 in this. Next slide, please. The Rajasthan is not in the top 10 of waste. <laughs> yes, you should be proud of it. That distinction, dubious distinction goes to Maharashtra. So Maharashtra, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, Kerala, Odisha, Karnataka, uh, Puducherry, uh, they have all this uh, waste. Well, this was done by the Indian government. They've done a wonderful job. And uh, what I'm trying to say here is the hazardous waste uh, accumulated by our states, we are 25, 27 now. So they are uh, not a good sign of improvement, of development. Uh, something to think about. Well, we will, if I'm the chief minister of the place, I will not be showing you this uh, because I, I want to show the best part of me. And this is not the best part of me. And uh, for that, since this is from the Department of Zoology in Rajasthan, and I have a connection being in Jaipur, so I will still say, brothers and sisters, you're lucky, you're doing good. Congratulations. Thank you. Keep it up. Good job. Okay, next, please. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, now they are, you know, this uh, our very beautiful country has done some very beautiful jobs. Uh, they are, they are boards and committees. So just for your knowledge, uh, the pollution control board uh, and the pollution control committee is there, uh, who make sure that uh, I'm sure you know all this: the recyclable and the incinerable and the landfill, so that our hazardous waste um, go in. I want to tell you something, a secret. I go to some countries and then I stay there. I have to stay there. And uh, people like to take photographs. Uh, please go to the next slide. This is important. And uh, talk about food and the tourist attractions. And well, it's also natural, right? 
uh, of course nowadays in digital selfie what the trend setting uh, i do not take interest in such things i ask the first question where do you put your waste you know in the morning when the truck comes and they take your waste i will ask them where do you take it uh well interesting question well that's my interest that's my passion and i will judge the country by the way they dispose their waste because that is how good or bad you actually are so here it's an old slide actually uh, this is an uh, you know we have an on site and an off site and then we will have a total site so the, there's a water treatment and incineration energy recovery then there's a deep well uh, injection and the landfill you know we have landfill landfill everywhere uh, other recycling uh, treatments some countries have some don't have not it's not there with everyone and then what uh, the public sewage uh, treatment system and then the uh, you have the out of state uh, countries have many states and some countries have no states imagine that and the incineration uh, cement uh, kiln as we call it and then the uh, storage uh, places the capture facilities the recycling and the landfilling uh, you know you just can't wash off your hands and say okay my house is clean i'm clean i've taken my bath i've swept the floor done for the day it doesn't work that way what about your neighbors what about your street and then slowly slowly your city and then your state your country your continent and that's how the world is we have a program here where the the home minister comes and and does something very beautiful you will, you will be shocked he comes in a bmw to tell that i'm not a pauper and don't laugh at me just because i'm doing a different job and he will sweep the street and an example for the citizens that look there is no shame in doing something you are cleaning your own house you are cleaning your own street what is the shame in that just you don't have to be a doctor engineer lawyer all the time you can be anybody the big question is what are we leaving behind as legacy for others what good examples we leave behind that is more important so this hazardous waste is basically i call it a hazardous mind first clean your mind then everything else will be clean yes yeah, strong words i'm sorry but you may not want to want to invite me again but then again you may okay uh, this is a beautiful pie chart you know they call it the recycling the landfill disposal recycling you know imagine it's most of the place then the landfill disposal uh compost as we call it biogas production so i call it the first four maybe the five we use up to here things are going fine then the recovery land farming the incineration energy recovery the other treatment the fertilizer and the two uh, damaging the hazardous landfill disposal and the incineration without energy recovery so in other words this uh, this chart is explaining again as we call it the reduce the reuse the recycle slow guys i say uh, how the waste have to be managed um, so this is a chart that this is how they are actually managed uh, in a way globally and this is how they are taken up uh, so far so good it works but i always ask for people come up with great ideas there's always a genius behind you there's always a genius inside you uh, knock the door you may find the solution very fast very soon uh thank you next slide please okay the characteristics of the hazardous waste you see the they be categorized as recyclable where resource recovery is possible by reprocessing the waste uh to go fast i think uh, this, you know, time is there uh, destruction and energy recovery and as land fever waste uh, when there is uh, not suitable either for resource or energy recovery but uh, suitable for dumping with or without any treatment dumping goes around everywhere whenever you go abroad or wherever you enter another state even your own state just look at the dumping grounds and find out what's happening take interest in such subjects you will be surprised you will be shocked that you can do wonders you can have ideas which maybe even the government doesn't even think so what is a government people you and me we make we make the changes so let's let us make those changes why because the next slide talks about this okay the next one is the color coding if you've been to a hospital uh, you will find out but nowadays uh, if, if you go to a war zone also you will have this color coding 
uh, very important. Uh, this is international coding actually, infectious uh, yellow, because uh, COVID-19 is there now, right? You remember the infection diseases and in India had to go through very tough times. Um, so this is infection yellow, uh, which is waste that is required to be incinerated, right? So if it is orange, then it can be also purple. Uh, the waste is consisting of the cytostatic products and if it's yellow, black, offensive, uh, red, anatomical, the blue is waste and the black is the, which should not contain any infectious material, shops or medicinal products. So coding, uh, good to know. Uh, you don't have to memorize. You will come to it when you come to it. Okay, next, please. Uh, Next is basically the management disposable, the major issues of concern for the hazardous waste. We have these industrial incinerators and the dioxins and the furans. Uh, so what they have done is that it's called a CHWMF. This is basically the common hazardous waste management facility. And I have a picture, I think maybe yes. Uh, next please. Oh yes, wonderful. Industrial incinerator, this is how it looks like. Okay, oh, that's next please. Uh, how does the facility look like? Uh, go around, go around Rajasthan, go around India, go around abroad. See if you have an interest, we will know the country from this. Next, please. So, yeah, just have a look at this. So, this is not tourist attraction. This is not the place where we want to eat. But this is definitely the place where you want to dump. And you must have a reason for that. And you must be damn sure what you are doing. Because this is how your country will be judged. Any country will be judged. Unfortunately, we do not like to visit such places. Uh, so start doing this. Okay, thank you very much. Next, please. Uh, the hazardous effects of these substances, especially which are very harmful to man and the environment. Um, okay, the health impact uh, assessment. Ah, that's important. Uh, the HIA. Uh, yes, next, please. HIA. Okay, I think, oh, I have a lot of pages here. Um, health effects, please. Uh, can you go next slide, please? There's a chart. Yes, wonderful. So you can see, I'll just list them because it's to this one. Mercury lead, the cadmium, and this PVC. Oh, PVC, you all know, right? Uh, don't use it, they say. Uh, beryllium, uh, and then this uh, brometer, and hexagon chromium. Uh, okay, I'm talking mostly of this uh, human, so the health effects. Uh, basically, they affect the, you know, the cumulative the food chain. It's so close to us, right? Then they are toxic, and then they cause damage to the lungs, the respiration. They're carcinogenic, and then they build up the environment. And so we're talking of this uh, uh, environmental toxicity. So they do go to the environment, and that's where the everything goes wrong, honestly, because we have to breathe the air, we have to drink the water, and we have to eat the food, and that's where everything gets mixed up. Okay, wonderful. Next, please. Uh, this is that the Protection Act, as India has done in 1986. Basically, the uh, requirements of the Basel Convention. Uh, well, it's not much time to talk about it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, you're right. Okay. There's a Basel Convention mentioned here. Yes. Okay, the rules. Uh, okay, next one, please. Yeah, this map is important. Because we come to the Basel Convention, and what is this Basel Convention actually? So this took place actually in 2006, and then there were 168 countries. And uh, what they were doing is basically, uh, the next slide will explain this. Uh, can uh, Yes, wonderful. Okay, I'll see this. Uh, very wonderful. Uh, you can see there are 168, uh, they call it the parties to the Basel Convention in 2006. So the world got involved. And then uh, the total of 187. And uh, after 2004, frankly, nothing happened. And um, the non parties, you know, they have parties and the non parties. Uh, you just have to go up and see what kind of uh, things happen. Why the world is going upside down is because when we go very high in life, are we actually very sincere with ourselves and each other? A uh, question to ask. Uh, so here are the names of these uh, these countries, these places. 
who got very much involved. Um, so this Basel Convention basically, uh, I think the next, uh, I call it the reverse pyramid, will explain it very clearly because it's just a map of the world and then the convention it explains nothing much. Okay, this is beautiful. So there's a waste management hierarchy. And I will tell you where the trouble starts. You see, it's very easy to read this. Reuse, reduce, recycle. Okay, so don't keep on buying, just reuse them. Don't keep on just increasing your load, reduce your wants, ceiling or desires, I'll call it. Recycle. Well, if you can, wonderful, right? You can use the same thing again somehow. Now, the waste management hierarchy is called the reverse pyramid. This is the source of the reduction and the reuse. Should be the first one. I'm telling you, this is not the first one. And then the second, recycling, decomposing. Right? Third is energy recovery. Fourth is treatment and disposal. We are very happy with treatment and disposal. I don't like it, I throw it away. Oh, okay, let me get treated. Let's treat this thing. Then we go back to the energy recovery. Then we go back to the recycle. Source reduction and resource reuse, we do not want to do, do this. That's where the problem starts. So they make it into a reverse pyramid. That, hello, go upside down. Okay. So there is this Ministry of Environment and Forests going on, Maharashtra Pollution Control Board, okay, not necessary. Uh, we're sitting in Rajasthan at the moment, but because Maharashtra is you know, dubious distinction of getting the number one spot for the greatest waste. Okay, next please. Uh, maybe your financial capital, we understand. Um, you have this recycled or reprocessed for the value recovery. Uh, now, very important, this happens in India a lot and also other countries as well. Uh, used oil battery waste and other non-ferrous waste like zinc, lead, are uh, commonly recycled in India. And then the heavy metals like uh, lead, cadmium, arsenic, and chromium as well. Um, now, recycling. Uh, next, please. We may move a little faster now. Uh, recycling of the hazardous uh, waste. So this is just a picture, just to make you understand what's happening. And uh, go to go to petrol pump, especially you'll see them a lot around the world, especially from their children will learn, uh, students will learn. Uh, it's important for the youth to learn, uh, not to throw the water bottle from their car on the road, which is a shameful effect, and it's happening everywhere in the world, honestly speaking. Um, okay, the next one I want to give you as a little surprise here, uh, a mention, it's a mention actually, a one gallon of used oil is sufficient uh, Yes, thank you. One gallon of used oil is sufficient to contaminate one million gallons of uh, groundwater. Uh, you know how much uh, used oil is being used? Uh, and this is banned in India and it's banned in other countries, but honestly speaking, this, this, this is going on. Of course, they also mentioned the precious and the non-renewable resource and can be recycled back to pure loop oil again and again. Industries are using it. Uh, well, India is famous for sweets and the Hawaii's being an Indian. And uh, having a soft, this uh, what we call sweet tooth. Uh, yes, the oil is being reused. I'm telling you. Okay, next one. Uh, we have a few pictures here. The recycling, the paper, glass, plastic, metal. If it is not being used, start using this. At least we do our bit in a small way. Small drop of ocean have has that ripple effect, and it changes everything. Okay, for the new. Uh, Transmitters. Now everybody has a gadget. Uh, the next slide will explain this because the e-waste, the electronic waste, everybody has now iPhone and Android or at least a phone, if nothing else, and these iPads and these computers and laptops. Uh, life doesn't go without them. You may not have friends, but you have a phone now. This is how the joke goes. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Wonderful. Thank you. You know, there's something called Environmental Protection Agency. Thank God they have it. Imagine otherwise, nobody will ever protect this environment uh, because we are talking about it, uh, talking about its toxicity here. See, the, our dependence on the electronic products have grown uh, manifold. They, they call it e-waste, and it's all over the world. The richer, the more industrialized the country, honestly speaking, the worse it is. Uh, Fast-growing waste stream, uh, approximately one percent of the municipal solid waste. Can you believe this? Uh, okay, next one. I would love that you see this picture for another 30 seconds and then open up your soul. Accept the facts of life. This next picture should change your life forever. Maybe you can keep it for one minute. 
you can later charge me for, for extra timing. <laughs> but here is a it's a very strong message. It's a global message. This is not even in India. This is not even an Indian child. So this is what is happening, my dear brothers and sisters, dear friends. This is what is happening sadly in the world. This is called electronic waste. Imagine. You're not going to use a laptop for seven years. Did you know the new theory? Use your gadgets for seven years. And I have seen people <laughs> buying seven gadgets in one year. Uh, and this is creating a lot of toxicity. That child will be definitely very sick. Believe me. Okay, next one. Uh, we have this lead and mercury and chromium. And then we have this uh, television and CRT monitor. Uh, they contain about four pounds of lead on an average. Can you believe your television has four pounds of lead? Okay, something you can take back when you go back home uh, after listening to my very long, long speech. Uh, they contribute to the high level of mercury contamination. Uh, now, what to say? Next will be very disturbing. The next uh, slide is very disturbing. And I have a reason for that. Actually, that is the whole idea of this. If you see North America, let's go to North America. The arrow goes to China. Okay. From North America, it goes to China. And for Western Europe, it's going to Eastern Europe. It's coming to Senegal, Ivory Coast, Ghana, Benin, right? Nigeria, Egypt, Pakistan, Vietnam, Hong Kong. And I'm purposely using the word India last. So, dear friends, a lot of the waste in India is actually not Indian waste. It is Western European waste. Now, if I say this, definitely I will not be <laughs> welcome in Western Europe. So this is happening. If you do not know, know it now. This is happening. And this is not a sign of progress or development or education or money. This is a sign of nothing else but pure greed. And this is not going to end, I'm very sad to say. So if you go up in life, go up and sit in all these big conferences, scream, shout, show them what is going wrong, not what is going right. Because a lot is going wrong. And not everything we do is basically bad. Because some just get a bad name. Okay. Having uh, given my message, I means no words here. So recycling of the e-waste in the next uh, slide is a need of the day. We have to reduce, avoid pollution, extract valuable and limited resources. So the developed countries, India is a developed country, public and private organizations accept use waste computers, other electronics for recycling. Uh, you can keep on moving uh, your slides now, one by one. Uh, nothing much. Uh, next one, please. Okay, wonderful. Recycling, very good. Next one, please. Uh, go by. I will say why we buy dial and HP because at least they do some recycling. <laughs> so I endorse them. Yeah, look at the good points. Okay, next one, please. Okay, not important. This is all legislations and the rules and the um, the, the country has made some rules. Uh, okay, not important. There's a picture coming, which is interesting. You can have a look. Uh, next slide. Let's have a look. You may have passed this during your childhood, even now. Uh, you may not want to do that, right? So someone has to solve this problem. Uh, so this is where environmental toxicity, I would say, takes birth. Because this is where, and we, we are caught in the middle of nowhere, actually, because we are all are culprits, victims and culprits. OK, next one, please. I uh, salute the government of India here uh, for doing a marvelous job with their ministries and their uh, boards and their uh, committee. They're doing very hard work. So basically, the government, the organizations, the, the population, everybody has to uh, pitch in. It's not one man's job. Uh, you just can't point a finger at anybody. If you want to have a better world, you want to have a better life, you want to have this environmental uh, toxicity out of your life, well, uh, much has to be done. Much, much. I'm, I'm saying this. Okay, let me speak this in Hindi. The next one, Jaha Hariali, Waha Hai Kushali. I love this. I really love this. So, Jaha Hai Hariali, Waha Hai Kushali. So, why this uh, greenery and this uh, forestation and plant trees and uh, all this? Now they have vertical. Uh, Greens in uh, in hotels in five stars in uh, Singapore because it's a very small country. Uh, it's only it's a one I call it a state, a small state compared to a small district in India. So they can't even do it on the ground. So they will do it on the uh, <laughs> buildings or gardens. You may have this in Bangalore too. 
uh, so I salute India, the government of India. They are doing something. So we must support them to make our country better. Uh, okay, next is uh, this, this, the mother of every convention, I call it the Basel Convention. So the World Environmental Agreement on the Ways. Because you have to come to an agreement. After all this speech, it is meaningless. If I keep on speaking one hour and you go back home and say, oh, okay, done, done. It, it doesn't work this way. We are here to move mountains. And this is a mountain of waste in every country. And the countries are sending the mountains to other countries, imagine that. So there's an OECD uh, countries, the Organization for the Economic Cooperation and Environment, and then there are the non-OECD countries. So uh, I call it here, India's commitment to solve the problem, transboundary movement and disposable, uh, is really important. Okay, uh, keep on moving, please. Oh, this seems to have gone so long, huh? Yeah. But I take a lot of, uh, you know, uh, passion in this work. Uh, so forgive me by saying this, and my apologies if I have uh, uh, bored a few people. Mm. Just keep on moving, please. Okay. Nothing much to learn, no. Just uh, move, and uh, there will be a lot to see. So you can just enjoy the work and uh, uh, toxicology, rules of exposure. <laughs> And then they are uh, what is happening on our health. Uh, as you can see now, the, the doctors work coming and the corrosive chemicals. Uh, it doesn't uh, end here. Uh, I told her 30 minutes, it's going to be 60, I think. Uh, once the, okay, the health effects short and respiratory, yeah, we know we are, we are having these problems now. We, how come asthma is so much there in the world, sinusitis and all that? Uh, and then we have these uh, short-term and long-term effects. Uh, yes, it really gets the brunt, actually. Um, as we uh, yeah, as we, as we call it. Uh, well, these are all this, um, the PPM, uh, how much you inhale and what will happen later. Um, we're doing it daily, right? Some smells you like, like the Hawaii smell we will like, but some smells we will not like. And many are pollutants. Uh, well, there's a lot of work done. If we give another few minutes, uh, dust and dander and with dust mites and bacteria because we have four seasons in India. You see the summer and winter also comes in. And then and then the little uh, this this uh, geographical like a uh, large distance uh, basically a desert and then uh, of course a beautiful desert which everyone wants to visit. Uh, a great uh, state. Uh, but then you also have problems, you know, the allergens and then the carcinogens. So all this is going to create problems in our respiratory tract. Um, I think I'm sorry, I have to move very fast in the, our, our airways and uh, they cause, uh, how come we must have asked why so much cancer in the world? You know? uh, we have to ask this question. Uh, skin, because it's the largest organ in our body, uh, it covers all our organs. And uh, so please, uh, if you have a chance, okay, I will, <laughs> the doctor has come out of me now, do an allergen test in the hospital. Find out, nobody is allergic, allergic proof. Let me tell you one thing. Do an allergen test and find out, if, are you allergic to anything? Do not take that. Of course, it's fancy and all the doctors will tell you, but there's so many things you may be surprised you may be allergic to and not even knowing it. Uh, so this allergen test will tell you and they will have that uh, reaction and then the doctor will make a list for you and you can show it to anyone, especially when you go abroad. Uh, because uh, they will ask you this question that people are sitting in aeroplanes having peanut allergy and uh, you can imagine uh, what kind of emergency we have in the aircraft if there is allergy just by a humble, wrongfully, as we call it. So the photo sensitizes the skin. Uh, skin gets you bright because the organ that covers us. So especially this, uh, I told you chloracne during the Vietnam War. Uh, that's a very severe form of acne. Um, though our teenagers um, who don't want to have acne. Um, yes, I agree. So we will not look so um, clean, beautiful. Um, but we are exposed to all these irritants in our life. Uh, now the eyes, uh, please, 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 I want to tell you something here as a doctor that the, do not touch your eyes always and do not rub your eyes always and wash your eyes. When you go home now, wash your eyes. If ice cold water even much better. Keep your eye drops in your fridge. Uh, save yourself. And if you have touched something you do not know, uh, first wash with soap, then touch your eyes. Uh, see, you have to wear your mask now, COVID-19, <laughs> that is one reason. Uh, but when you are uh, maybe given a tour, say, to one of these uh, 
places. Uh, I call it the, of course, to go into a restaurant is not easy. Uh, to other places where you need such a heavy duty mask, as I call it, uh, it is basically to save yourself. Because the pollutants uh, somehow enter uh, the nostrils. Mm, next, please. Skin. Uh, now the eyes. Okay, done. Central nervous system, eyes. Um, so chemical burns, very important. Like there's an ophthalmologist now sitting or uh, listening. I'm sure he will. He can talk about one hour on this subject only. And uh, this is wonderful. Our eyes are very important. And uh, please, please take care of your eyes. And if you don't understand anything, just wear this the zero number bubbles, as I call it, those glasses. Especially driving um, during our. Uh, you have storms in Rajasthan, I think. Those are sand storms. Uh, then see in movies. Uh, so, very important. You don't see that all these are toxic. Okay, central nervous systems. Um, I did. I wanted to talk about much about this. See, so, so you can die before the oxygen or the glucose transport um, can come. Imagine during COVID-19, if you remember, uh, what was the biggest story that we received from India was that the lack of oxygen. Everybody was carrying an oxygen cylinder. Uh, so you can just uh, imagine. Uh, I think we are going to have further here. Okay, the local effects of the CNS, the central nervous system on the skin, the lung, the gastrointestinal tract, and the brain, and the circuit system, and the liver, and the kidneys, and the, and the bones. I want to talk about liver here. The liver is the master organ, and we talk very little, though I will always <laughs> give my social sloka that please, anybody drinking, stop drinking. Uh, your liver will be damaged, but of course, you don't have to listen to me. And um, other effects are uh, on the CNN. Uh, they reduce the blood pressure and uh, flow due to the cardiac arrest and extreme hypertension or the hemorrhaging. Okay, liver. Um, you know, very least understood. Uh, injury induced by the chemicals has been known as toxicological problem. This is a very, very uh, serious problem. Let me tell you this. Okay, next one, please. Come to the liver. Yes, this is a master organ. We have 500 vital functions here. The immunity, you know, is a factory for protein and cholesterol. Squeeze the bile and squeeze the waste and the converts the cells of the glucose to starch and clears the blood of drugs. Uh, you know, it purifies. So you imagine if you take drugs, it's going to be clear and clean here. So you could thank your liver for that. And uh, regulates the, don't thank the doctor, thank your liver. <laughs> regulates the blood clotting, uh, detoxifying pathways. Uh, it's a lot to. Not, not here. Okay, let me come to the next one. Kidneys. Okay, great. Heavy metals. Uh, please read in the ingredients whenever you are, you know, into all these foods. Mercury, arsenic, gold, cadmium, lead, silver. Yes, gold. Passion for Indians, especially. Uh, but God's sake, uh, don't drink, eat gold. <laughs> especially, you know that uh, what the work they call the silver and the gold. Uh, it's a fashion. Uh, it's a rich man's uh, symbol. Halogenated uh, organic compounds. Have you heard of chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine? Okay. Uh, this metabolism of these compounds, um, because we are talking about uh, you know the agriculture fields here and the toxicity uh, and the environment. So the herbicide cannot escape. The fumigants, uh, the farmers will be doing it, and that uh, you are trying to save the plant from let us say the organism. Uh, the pest, the insect, but you are inhaling it. And uh, even if you wear whatever you want to wear. Okay, how the kidney works uh, may not be much of interest here. Now, lead, copper, mercury, arsenic, and we'll just take care of these five uh, heavy metals. I call it poisons. But you heard of arsenic poisoning? Uh, come to any emergency and you will know the, the doctor panics more than the patient there. Okay. So I think I've probably come to the end here. The guidelines, uh, toxicology properties, and safe exposure limits for many different materials. Uh, see, this is for animal exposure. You know, this is a guideline from animal. Can you believe this? This book made for human is from animals. And there may be problems in trying to use the data for human exposure. OK, the guidelines, uh, I want to, to focus on this last thing. This is very important. Because at least take your know, takeaway message after listening to this man for, say, one hour. Uh, look at the words highlighted, the dark. Avoid the contact. Avoid breathing vapors. However, this does not give a safe exposure limit. One may question whether the warning means to avoid any possible contact. So whenever anything is written like that, believe it. 
respect it, follow it, because it will save you. It will save you a lot of problems. Uh, because it may be, uh, you know, containing something which actually may be very harmful to you. Uh, so any chemical exposure or the irritant or the corrosive, as you call it, uh, can harm a person. And the warning signs have to be there and have to be read and adhered to. Because many of us just don't bother and we just follow other people's advice and think, oh, so he has taken it, I will take it. No, not necessarily. You can be even allergic to the person. Wonderful. I want to thank my guru here, Sri Bala Krishnamurti, his, his publication. Uh, of course, Wikipedia as well. Uh, I want to say something here, very beautiful. Uh, Mother Teresa, I admire her, simple. If we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. I will still come back to that war that we are still going on. I still come back to that agent orange. We started my life with such passion. I will still come back to the theodom of the fact of the child I first saw in my life without hands and feet, and I cried for one hour. <laughs> that changed my life forever. Even now, I cannot speak very clearly because I have become very emotional now. Because I want to thank this university, this college, this Rajasthan, this India, for what you have done, especially to me. I want to thank you. Please take care of this world. Let's care about our environment. We have only one planet. We have planet A. These are only countries. We can visit each other anytime. But it's important to save our, ourselves and to save each other. We, we belong to each other. Jai Hind. Thank you. Dhaniawad. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Lekhi. And trust me, it was just amazing. You are a medical doctor, right? But uh, when I heard this lecture, I believe that you are more better a toxicologist. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I like to learn. I am still learning. So I thought, why not learn zoology? <laughs> Since you are in zoology. So it is no shame to learn. And I'm learning from you. No, no, it's, it's not. Oh, that, that's wonderful. Um, now let me give you a formal vote of thanks. Thank you for serving as a speaker in ISTTP1, Dr. Lekhi. Your readiness to share your experience and expertise on the topic kept everyone, including us, spellbound. You are an expert in your field, and to have you as a keynote speaker here, the best we could have done to inspire our delegates. Your bright ideas and comforting guidance has a great positive impact on all the attendees. I take this opportunity to thank you on the behalf of the entire team. Your talk has worked as a starting point to resolve important issues in the area and inspired many of us to take individual initiative. Yeah, now something which I have snatched out of your talk. You so correctly mentioned that we are not ready for COVID. We were not ready for COVID-19 and we aren't ready for the chemical and biological warfare. It's very true and that Dr. S. J. S. Flora also said. Let me tell you that I'm basically a pesticide toxicologist and I have read Silent Spring and Raquel Carson is my hero. What she did, please close the mic. What she did for saving the population of bald eagle in USA is commendable. You spoke about defoliating pesticide agent, the agent orange, which is another horrific example of pesticide pollution. You explain environmental toxicology in such a simple and beautiful way. Your slide on bioconcentration and biomagnification was so amazing and self-explanatory. And you so correctly stated that we are creating problems for animals and animals aren't creating any problem for humans. Rather, they are our food. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mamta. I'm hearing you and I, 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 I'm so I, impressed. I have, <laughs> I have still something to say. Now, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, where I was, I uh, let me the let me look back where I was talking to you about magnification. I will tell you. 
Man is the smartest animal on the earth, and what he is doing to environment defy this. If he would have been smartest animal, he would have saved the mother nature. You correctly said that we have only one mother nature. You spoke about DDT, and let me tell you, it is the most mysterious compound. I have been working on DDT since last twenty years, and yes, we have only one earth, one mother nature. Let's save it. Am I audible? So what I what is my field of pesticide toxicology is very interesting. I feel because since you are a medical doctor, I've been working with Indian Council of Medical Research for long. So my studies are on human beings. So when the pregnant woman get exposed to pesticides, mainly DDT, BHC, gabapentin, I'm talking about organochlorine pesticides. Placenta doesn't act as a barrier. They all cross the placenta, goes to the developing baby. And imagine, they are potent carcinogens, mutagens, and teratogens. So how can we say man is the smartest animal? I think he's the fullest one. So let me thank you once again. Very well said. Very well said. This is the end of the first day of ISCTP one. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the speakers who all were very learned, knowledgeable scientists in their field, and they have spared. their valuable time to be with us here in this training program i would like to tell all the speakers that we the organizers and the participants are very happy and delighted to have you here with us and i hope you also had a wonderful time wonderful time with us like we had with you the feedback form will be circulated on the whatsapp group and on telegram and with and would be open till 12 am today so fill it don't forget to fill it because your critical views are very very important to us so that we can further improve in the training so now this is dr mamta sharma organizing secretary of the isctp1 along with my patron and principal and my team is signing off from the campus of rrc alwar we will see you tomorrow again at 11 am indian standard time sharp 11 am indian standard time with new speakers and bucket full of knowledge So till that time, stay safe, stay healthy, and be very, very happy. So we are signing off. We all see you tomorrow. Bye bye, and have a great day. See you. Band kar do meeting. Meeting band karo. maybe they are taking some time for the technical things let's talk something else till they you all have been a wonderful part participants who is presenting